Chapter One of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage in September two thousand and seven. Chapter One. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighbourhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. "'My dear Mr. Bennet,' said his lady to him one day, "'have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last?' Mr. Bennet replied that he had not. "'But it is,' returned she, "'for Mrs. Long has just been here, and she told me all about it.' Mr. Bennet made no answer. "'Do you not want to know who has taken it?' cried his wife impatiently. "'You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it.' This was invitation enough. "'Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England, that he came down on Monday in a chaise and four to see the place, and was so much delighted with it, that he agreed with Mr. Morris immediately, that he is to take possession before Michaelmas, and some of his servants are to be in the house by the end of next week.' And "'What is his name?' "'Bingley. Is he married or single?' "'Oh, single, my dear, to be sure. A single man of large fortune, four or five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls! How so? How can it affect them?' "'My dear Mr. Bennet,' replied his wife, "'how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I am thinking of his marrying one of them.' "'Is that his design in settling here?' "'Design? Nonsense! How can you talk so? But it is very likely that he may fall in love with one of them, and therefore you must visit him as soon as he comes.' I see no occasion for that. You and the girls may go, or you may send them by themselves, which perhaps will be still better, for as you are as handsome as any of them, Mr. Bingley may like you the best of the party. My dear, you flatter me. I certainly have had my share of beauty, but I do not pretend to be anything extraordinary now. When a woman has five grown-up daughters, she ought to give over thinking of her own beauty. In such cases a woman has not often much beauty to think of. "'But, my dear, you must indeed go and see Mr. Bingley when he comes into the neighbourhood. "'It is more than I engage for, I assure you. "'But consider your daughters. "'Only think what an establishment it would be for one of them. "'Sir William and Lady Lucas are determined to go, merely on that account, "'for in general, you know, they visit no newcomers. "'Indeed you must go, for it will be impossible for us to visit him if you do not. "'You are over-scrupulous, surely. "'I dare say Mr. Bingley will be very glad to see you.' and I will send a few lines by you to assure him of my hearty consent to his marrying whichever he chooses of the girls, though I must throw in a good word for my little Lizzie. I desire you will do no such thing. Lizzie is not a bit better than the others, and I am sure she is not half so handsome as Jane, no half so good-humoured as Lydia. But you are always giving her the preference." "'They have none of them much to recommend them,' replied he. "'They are all silly and ignorant like other girls. But Lizzie has something more of quickness than her sister's. "'Mr. Bennet, how can you abuse your own children in such a way? You take delight in vexing me. You have no compassion for my poor nerves.' "'You mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these last twenty years, at least. Ah, oh, you do not know what I suffer!' But I hope you will get over it, and live to see many young men of four thousand a year come into the neighbourhood. It will be no use to us if twenty such should come, since you will not visit them. Depend upon it, my dear, that when there are twenty, I will visit them all." Mr. Bennet was so odd a mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humour, reserve, and caprice, that the experience of three and twenty years had been insufficient to make his wife understand his character. Her mind was less difficult to develop. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information, and uncertain temper. When she was discontented, she fancied herself nervous. The business of her life was to get her daughters married. Its solace was visiting and news. End of chapter 1《》Chapter 2 Mr. Bennet was among the earliest of those who waited on Mr. Bingley. He had always intended to visit him, though to the last always assuring his wife that he should not go. Until the evening after the visit was paid, she had no knowledge of it. 
It was then disclosed in the following manner. Observing his second daughter employed in trimming a hat, he suddenly addressed her with, "'I hope Mr. Bingley will like it, Lizzie.' "'We are not in a way to know what Mr. Bingley likes,' said her mother resentfully, "'since we are not to visit.' "'But you forget, mamma," said Elizabeth, "'that we shall meet him at the assemblies, and that Mrs. Long promised to introduce him.' "'I do not believe Mrs. Long will do any such thing. She has two nieces of her own. She is a selfish, hypocritical woman, and I have no opinion of her.' "'No more have I,' said Mr. Bennet, "'and I am glad to find that you do not depend on her serving you.' Mrs. Bennet deigned not to make any reply, but, unable to contain herself, began scolding one of her daughters. "'Don't keep coughing so, Kitty, for heaven's sake! Have a little compassion on my nerves. You tear them to pieces.' "'Kitty has no discretion in her coughs,' said her father. "'She times them ill.' "'I do not cough for my own amusement,' replied Kitty fretfully. "'When is your next ball to be, Lizzie?' "'Tomorrow fortnight.' "'Aye, so it is,' cried her mother. "'And Mrs. Long does not come back till the day before, so it will be impossible for her to introduce him, for she will not know him herself.' "'Then, my dear, you may have the advantage of your friend, and introduce Mr. Bingley to her.' "'Impossible, Mr. Bennet, impossible, when I am not acquainted with him myself. How can you be so teasing?' "'I honour your circumspection. A fortnight's acquaintance is certainly very little. One cannot know what a man really is by the end of a fortnight. But if we do not venture, somebody else will. And, after all, Mrs. Long and her daughters must stand their chance. And, therefore, as she would think it an act of kindness if you decline the office, I will take it on myself." The girl stared at their father. Mrs. Bennet said only, "'Nonsense! Nonsense!' "'What can be the meaning of that emphatic exclamation?' cried he. "'Do you consider the forms of introduction and the stress that is laid on them as nonsense? I cannot quite agree with you there. What say you, Mary? For you are a young lady of deep reflection, I know, and read great books and make extracts.' Mary wished to say something sensible, but knew not how. "'While Mary is adjusting her ideas,' he continued, "'let us return to Mr. Bingley.' "'I am sick of Mr. Bingley,' cried his wife. "'I am sorry to hear that. But why did you not tell me that before? If I had known as much this morning, I certainly would not have called on him. It is very unlucky. But as I have actually paid the visit, we cannot escape the acquaintance now.' The astonishment of the ladies was just what he wished. That of Mrs. Bennet, perhaps, surpassing the rest, though, when the first tumult of joy was over, she began to declare that it was what she had expected all the while. "'How good it was in you, my dear Mr. Bennet! But I knew I should persuade you at last. I was sure you loved your girls too well to neglect such an acquaintance. Well, how pleased I am! And it is such a good joke, too, that you should have gone this morning, and never said a word about it till now.' "'Now, Kitty, you may cough as much as you choose,' said Mr. Bennet, and as he spoke he left the room, fatigued with the raptures of his wife. "'What an excellent father you have, girls,' said she, when the door was shut. "'I do not know how you will ever make him amends for his kindness, or me either, for that matter. At our time of life it is not so pleasant, I can tell you, to be making new acquaintances every day. But for your sakes we would do anything. Lydia, my love, though you are the youngest, I dare say Mr. Bingley will dance with you at the next ball.' "'Oh!' said Lydia stoutly. "'I am not afraid. For though I am the youngest, I am the tallest.' The rest of the evening was spent in conjecturing how soon he would return Mr. Bennet's visit, and determining when they should ask him to dinner. End of chapter 2《Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Not all that Mrs. Bennet, however, with the assistance of her five daughters, could ask on the subject, was sufficient to draw from her husband any satisfactory description of Mr. Bingley. They attacked him in various ways, with barefaced questions, ingenuous suppositions, and distant surmises, but he eluded the skill of them all, and they were at last obliged to accept the second-hand intelligence of their neighbour, Lady Lucas. Her report was highly favourable. Sir William had been delighted with him. He was quite young, wonderfully handsome, extremely agreeable, and to crown the whole, he meant to be at the next assembly with a large party. Nothing could be more delightful. To be fond of dancing was a certain step towards falling in love, and very lively hopes of Mr. Bingley's heart were entertained. "'If I can but see one of my daughters happily settled at Neverfield,' said Mrs. Bennet to her husband, "'and all the others equally well married, I shall have nothing to wish for.' 
In a few days Mr. Bingley returned Mr. Bennet's visit, and sat about ten minutes with him in his library. He had entertained hopes of being admitted to a sight of the young ladies, of whose beauty he had heard much, but he saw only the father. The ladies were somewhat more fortunate, for they had the advantage of ascertaining from an upper window that he wore a blue coat and rode a black horse. An invitation to dinner was soon afterwards dispatched, and already had Mrs. Bennet planned the courses that were to do credit to her housekeeping, when an answer arrived which deferred it all. Mr. Bingley was obliged to be in town the following day, and consequently unable to accept the honour of their invitation, etc. Mrs. Bennet was quite disconcerted. She could not imagine what business he could have in town so soon after his arrival in Hertfordshire, and she began to fear that he might be always flying about from one place to another, and never settled at Netherfield as he ought to be. Lady Lucas quieted her fears a little by stating the idea of his being gone to London only to get a large party for the ball, and a report soon followed that Mr. Bingley was to bring twelve ladies and seven gentlemen with him to the assembly. The girls grieved over such a number of ladies, but were comforted the day before the ball by hearing that, instead of twelve, he brought only six with him from London, his five sisters and a cousin. And when the party entered the assembly room, it consisted only of five altogether, Mr. Bingley, his two sisters, the husband of the eldest, and another young man. Mr. Bingley was good-looking and gentlemanlike. He had a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. His sisters were fine women, with an air of decided fashion. His brother-in-law, Mr. Hurst, merely looked the gentleman, but his friend Mr. Darcy soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, noble mien, and the report which was in general circulation within five minutes after his entrance, of his having ten thousand a year. The gentleman pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man, the ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr. Bingley, and he was looked at with great admiration for about half the evening till his manners gave a disgust which turned the tide of his popularity, for he was discovered to be proud, to be above his company, and above being pleased, and not all his large estate in Derbyshire could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance, and being unworthy to be compared with his friend. Mr. Bingley had soon made himself acquainted with all the principal people in the room. He was lively and unreserved, danced every dance, was angry that the ball closed so early, and talked of giving one himself at Netherfield. Such amiable qualities must speak for themselves. What a contrast between him and his friend! Mr. Darcy danced only once with Mrs. Hurst, and once with Miss Bingley, declined being introduced to any other lady, and spent the rest of the evening in walking about the room, speaking occasionally to one of his own party. His character was decided. He was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. Amongst the most violent against him was Mrs. Bennet, whose dislike of his general behaviour was sharpened into particular resentment by his having slighted one of her daughters. Elizabeth Bennet had been obliged, by the scarcity of gentlemen, to sit down for two dances, and during part of that time Mr. Darcy had been standing near enough for her to hear a conversation between him and Mr. Bingley, who came from the dance for a few minutes to press his friend to join it. "'Come, Darcy,' said he, "'I must have you dance. I hate to see you standing about by yourself in this stupid manner. You had much better dance.' "'I certainly shall not. You know how I detest it, unless I am particularly acquainted with my partner. At such an assembly as this it would be insupportable. Your sisters are engaged, and there is not another woman in the room whom it would not be a punishment to me to stand up with.' "'I would not be so fastidious as you are,' cried Mr. Bingley, "'for a kingdom. Upon my honour, I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life as I have this evening, and there are several of them, you see, uncommonly pretty.' "'You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room,' said Mr. Darcy, looking at the eldest Miss Bennet. "'Oh, she is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. But there is one of her sisters sitting down just behind you, who is very pretty, and I dare say very agreeable. Do let me ask my partner to introduce you.' "'Which do you mean?' and turning round he looked for a moment at Elizabeth, till, catching her eye, he withdrew his own, and coldly said, "'She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. I am in no humour at present to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles, for you are wasting your time with me.' Mr. Bingley followed his advice. Mr. Darcy walked off, and Elizabeth remained with no very cordial feelings toward him. She told the story, however, with great spirit among her friends, for she had a lively, playful disposition which delighted in anything ridiculous. The evening altogether passed off pleasantly to the whole family. 
Mrs. Bennet had seen her eldest daughter much admired by the Netherfield party. Mr. Bingley had danced with her twice, and she had been distinguished by his sisters. Jane was as much gratified by this as her mother could be, though in a quieter way. Elizabeth felt Jane's pleasure. Mary had heard herself mentioned to Miss Bingley as the most accomplished girl in the neighbourhood, and Catherine and Lydia had been fortunate enough never to be without partners, which was all that they had yet learnt to care for at a ball. They returned, therefore, in good spirits to Longbourn, the village where they lived, and of which they were the principal inhabitants. They found Mr. Bennet still up. With the book he was regardless of time, and on the present occasion he had a good deal of curiosity as to the events of an evening which had raised such splendid expectations. He had rather hoped that his wife's views on the stranger would be disappointed, but he soon found out that he had a different story to hear. "'Oh, my dear Mr. Bennet,' as she entered the room, "'we have had a most delightful evening, a most excellent ball. I wish you had been there. Jane was so admired, nothing could be like it. Everybody said how well she looked, and Mr. Bingley thought her quite beautiful, and danced with her twice. Only think of that, my dear! He actually danced with her twice, and she was the only creature in the room that he asked a second time. First of all he asked Miss Lucas. I was so vexed to see him stand up with her.' But, however, he did not admire her at all. Indeed, nobody can, you know. And he seemed quite struck with Jane as she was going down the dance. So he inquired who she was, and got introduced, and asked her for the two next. Then the two third he danced with Miss King, and the two fourth with Maria Lucas, and the two fifth with Jane again, and the two sixth with Lizzie, and the boulanger. If he had had any compassion for me, cried her husband impatiently, he would not have danced half so much. For God's sake, say no more of his partners. Oh, that he had sprained his ankle in the first place! Oh, my dear, I am quite delighted with him. He is so excessively handsome, and his sisters are charming women. I never in my life saw anything more elegant than their dresses. I dare say the lace upon Mrs. Hurst's gown— Here she was interrupted again. Mr. Bennet protested against any description of finery. She was therefore obliged to seek another branch of the subject, and related, with much bitterness of spirit and some exaggeration, the shocking rudeness of Mr. Darcy. "'But I can assure you,' she added, "'that Lizzie does not lose much by not suiting his fancy, "'for he is a most disagreeable, horrid man, not at all worth pleasing. "'So high and so conceited, that there was no enduring him. "'He walked here and he walked there, fancying himself so very great. "'Not handsome enough to dance with. "'I wish you had been there, my dear, to have given him one of your set-downs. "'I quite detest the man.'" End of chapter 3《ハプナー》When Jane and Elizabeth were alone, the former, who had been cautious in her praise of Mr. Bingley before, expressed to her sister just how very much she admired him. "'He is just what a young man ought to be,' said she. "'Sensible, good-humoured, lively, and I never saw such happy manners. So much ease, with such perfect good breeding.' "'He is also handsome,' replied Elizabeth, "'which a young man ought likewise to be, if he possibly can. His character is thereby complete.' I was very much flattered by his asking me to dance a second time. I did not expect such a compliment. Did not you? I did for you. But that is one great difference between us. Compliments always take you by surprise, and me never. What could be more natural than his asking you again? He could not help seeing that you were about five times as pretty as every other woman in the room. No thanks to his gallantry for that. Well, he certainly is very agreeable, and I give you leave to like him. You have liked many a stupider person. "'Dear Lizzie, "'Oh, you are a great deal too apt, you know, to like people in general. "'You never see a fault in anybody. "'All the world are good and agreeable in your eyes. "'I never heard you speak ill of a human being in your life. "'I would not wish to be hasty in censuring any one, "'but I always speak what I think. "'I know you do. "'And it is that which makes the wonder. "'With your good sense to be so honestly blind to the follies and nonsense of others.' Affectation of candour is common enough, one meets with it everywhere. But to be candid without ostentation or design, to take the good of everybody's character and make it still better, and say nothing of the bad, belongs to you alone. And so you like this man's sisters too, do you? Their manners are not equal to his. Certainly not, at first. But they are very pleasing women when you converse with them. Miss Bingley is to live with her brother and keep his house— and I am much mistaken if we shall not find a very charming neighbour in her." Elizabeth listened in silence, but was not convinced. 
their behaviour at the assembly had not been calculated to please in general, and with more quickness of observation and less pliancy of temper than her sister, and with a judgment too unassailed by any attention to herself, she was very little disposed to approve of them. They were in fact very fine ladies, not deficient in good humour when they were pleased, nor in the power of making themselves agreeable when they chose it, but proud and conceited. They were rather handsome, had been educated in one of the first private seminaries in town, had a fortune of twenty thousand pounds, were in the habit of spending more than they ought, and of associating with people of rank, and were therefore in every respect entitled to think well of themselves, and meanly of others. They were of a respectable family in the north of England, a circumstance more deeply impressed on their memories than that their brother's fortune and their own had been acquired by trade. Mr. Bingley inherited property to the amount of nearly a hundred thousand pounds from his father, who had intended to purchase an estate, but did not live to do it. Mr. Bingley intended it likewise, and sometimes made choice of his county. But as he was now provided with a good house and the liberty of a manor, it was doubtful to many of those who best knew the easiness of his temper whether he might not spend the remainder of his days at Netherfield, and leave the next generation to purchase. His sisters were anxious for his having an estate of his own, but though he was now only established as a tenant, Miss Bingley was by no means unwilling to preside at his table, nor was Mrs. Hurst, who had married a man of more fashion than fortune, less disposed to consider his house as her home when it suited her. Mr. Bingley had not been of age two years when he was tempted by an accidental recommendation to look at Netherfield House. He did look at it, and into it, for almost half an hour, was pleased with the situation in the principal rooms, satisfied with what the owner said in its praise, and took it immediately. Between him and Darcy there was a very steady friendship, in spite of great opposition of character. Bingley was endeared to Darcy by the easiness, openness, and ductility of his temper, though no disposition could offer a greater contrast to his own, and though with his own he never appeared dissatisfied. On the strength of Darcy's regard Bingley had the firmest reliance, and of his judgment the highest opinion. In understanding Darcy was the superior. Bingley was by no means deficient, but Darcy was clever. He was at the same time haughty, reserved, and fastidious, and his manners, though well-bred, were not inviting. In that respect, his friend had greatly the advantage. Bingley was sure of being liked wherever he appeared. Darcy was continually giving offence. The manner in which they spoke of the Meryton Assembly was sufficiently characteristic. Bingley had never met with more pleasant people or prettier girls in his life. Everybody had been most kind and attentive to him. There had been no formality, no stiffness. He had soon felt acquainted with all the room, and as to Miss Bennet, he could not conceive an angel more beautiful. Darcy, on the contrary, had seen a collection of people in whom there was little beauty and no fashion, for none of whom he had felt the smallest interest, and from none received either attention or pleasure. Miss Bennet he acknowledged to be pretty, but she smiled too much. Mrs. Hurst and her sister allowed it to be so. But still they admired her and liked her, and pronounced her to be a sweet girl, and one whom they would not object to know more of. Miss Bennet was therefore established as a sweet girl, and their brother felt authorised by such commendation to think of her as he chose. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Within a short walk of Longbourn lived a family with whom the Bennets were particularly intimate. Sir William Lucas had been formerly in trade in Meryton, where he had made a tolerable fortune, and risen to the honour of knighthood by an address to the King during his mayoralty. The distinction had perhaps been felt too strongly. It had given him a disgust to his business, and to his residence in a small market town, and in quitting them both, he had removed with his family to a house about a mile from Meryton, denominated from that period Lucas Lodge where he could think with pleasure of his own importance, and, unshackled by business, occupy himself solely in being civil to all the world. For though elated by his rank, it did not render him supercilious. On the contrary, he was all attention to everybody. By nature inoffensive, friendly, and obliging, his presentation at St. James had made him courteous. Lady Lucas was a very good kind of woman, not too clever to be a valuable neighbour to Mrs. Bennet. They had several children. The eldest of them, a sensible, intelligent young woman, about twenty-seven, was Elizabeth's intimate friend. That the Miss Lucases and the Miss Bennets should meet to talk over a ball was absolutely necessary, and the morning after the assembly brought the former to Longbourn to hear and to communicate. "'You began the evening well, Charlotte,' said Mrs. Bennet, with civil self-command to Miss Lucas. "'You were Mr. Bingley's first choice.' "'Yes,' 
but he seemed to like his second better. "'Oh, you mean Jane, I suppose, because he danced with her twice. To be sure, that did seem as if he admired her. Indeed, I rather believe he did. I heard something about it, but I hardly know what. Something about Mr. Robinson.' "'Perhaps you mean what I overheard between him and Mr. Robinson. Did not I mention it to you? Mr. Robinson's asking him how he liked our Meryton assemblies, and whether he did not think there were a great many pretty women in the room, and which he thought the prettiest, and his answering immediately to the last question, "'Oh, the eldest Miss Bennet, beyond a doubt. There cannot be two opinions on that point.' "'Pon my word! Well, that is very decided, indeed. That does seem as if—but, however, it may all come to nothing, you know.' "'My overhearings were more to the purpose than yours, Eliza,' said Charlotte. "'Mr. Darcy is not so well worth listening to as his friend, is he? Poor Eliza! To be only just tolerable! I beg you would not put it into Lizzy's head to be vexed by his ill-treatment, for he is such a disagreeable man, that it would be quite a misfortune to be liked by him. Mrs. Long told me last night that he sat close to her for half an hour without once opening his lips. "'Are you quite sure, ma'am?' "'Is there not a little mistake?' said Jane. "'I certainly saw Mr. Darcy speaking to her.' "'Aye, because she asked him at last how he liked Netherfield, and he could not help answering her. But she said he seemed quite angry at being spoke to.' "'Miss Bingley told me,' said Jane, "'that he never speaks much, unless among his intimate acquaintances. With them he is remarkably agreeable.' "'I do not believe a word of that, my dear. If he had been so very agreeable, he would have talked to Mrs. Long. But I can guess how it was.' Everybody says that he is eat up with pride, and I dare say he had heard somehow that Mrs. Long does not keep a carriage, and had come to the ball in a hack-chaise. "'I do not mind his not talking to Mrs. Long,' said Miss Lucas, "'but I wish he had danced with Eliza.' "'Another time, Lizzie,' said her mother, "'I would not dance with him if I were you.' "'I believe, ma'am, I may safely promise you never to dance with him.' "'His pride!' said Miss Lucas, does not offend me so much as pride often does, because there is an excuse for it. One cannot wonder that so very fine a young man, with family, fortune, everything in his favour, should think highly of himself. If I may so express it, he has a right to be proud. That is very true, replied Elizabeth, that I could easily forgive his pride, if he had not mortified mine. Pride observed Mary, who piqued herself upon the solidity of her reflections, is a very common failing, I believe. By all that I have ever read, I am convinced that it is very common indeed, that human nature is particularly prone to it, and that there are very few of us who do not cherish a feeling of self-complacency on the score of some quality or other, real or imaginary. Vanity and pride are different things, though the words are often used synonymously. A person may be proud without being vain. Pride relates more to our opinion of ourselves, vanity to what we would have others think of us. "'If I were as rich as Mr. Darcy,' cried a young Lucas, who came with his sisters, "'I should not care how proud I was. I would keep a pack of foxhounds and drink a bottle of wine a day.' "'Then you would drink a great deal more than you ought,' said Mrs. Bennet, "'and if I were to see you at it, I should take away your bottle directly.' The boy protested that she should not. She continued to declare that she would, and the argument ended only with the visit." End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The ladies of Longbourn soon waited on those of Netherfield. The visit was soon returned in due form. Miss Bennet's pleasing manners grew on the good will of Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and though the mother was found to be intolerable, and the younger sisters not worth speaking to, a wish of being better acquainted with them was expressed towards the two eldest. By Jane this attention was received with the greatest pleasure, but Elizabeth still saw superciliousness in their treatment of everybody, hardly excepting even her sister, and could not like them. Though their kindness to Jane, such as it was, had a value as arising in all probability from the influence of their brother's admiration. It was generally evident, whenever they met, that he did admire her, and to her it was equally evident that Jane was yielding to the preference which she had begun to entertain for him from the first, and was in a way to be very much in love. But she considered with pleasure that it was not likely to be discovered by the world in general, since Jane united, with great strength of feeling, a composure of temper and a uniform cheerfulness of manner which would guard her from the suspicions of the impertinent. She mentioned this to her friend Miss Lucas. "'It may perhaps be pleasant,' replied Charlotte, "'to be able to impose on the public in such a case. But it is sometimes a disadvantage to be so very guarded.' 
If a woman conceals her affection with the same skill from the object of it, she may lose the opportunity of fixing him, and it will then be but poor consolation to believe the world equally in the dark. There is so much of gratitude or vanity in almost every attachment, that it is not safe to leave any to itself. We can all begin freely, a slight preference is natural enough, but there are very few of us who have heart enough to be really in love without encouragement. In nine cases out of ten, a woman had better show more affection than she feels. Bingley likes your sister undoubtedly, but he may never do more than like her, if she does not help him on. But she does help him on, as much as her nature will allow. If I can perceive her regard for him, he must be a simpleton indeed not to discover it too. Remember, Eliza, that it is not no Jane's disposition as you do. But if a woman is partial to a man, and does not endeavour to conceal it, he must find it out. Perhaps he must, if he sees enough of her. But though Bingley and Jane meet tolerably often, it is never for many hours together. And as they always see each other in large mixed parties, it is impossible that every moment should be employed in conversing together. Jane should therefore make the most of every half-hour in which she can command his attention. When she is secure of him, there will be more leisure for falling in love as much as she chooses. "'Your plan is a good one,' replied Elizabeth, "'where nothing is in question but the desire of being well married. And if I were determined to get a rich husband, or any husband, I dare say I should adopt it.' But these are not Jane's feelings. She is not acting by design. As yet, she cannot even be certain of the degree of her own regard, nor of its reasonableness. She has known him only a fortnight. She danced four dances with him at Meryton. She saw him one morning at his own house, and has since dined with him in company four times. This is not quite enough to make her understand his character. Not as you represent it. Had she merely dined with him, she might only have discovered whether he had a good appetite. But you must remember that four evenings have also been spent together, and four evenings may do a great deal. Yes, these four evenings have enabled them to ascertain that they both like Van Damme better than commerce, but with respect to any other leading characteristic, I do not imagine that much has been unfolded. Well, said Charlotte, I wish Jane success with all my heart and if she were married to him to-morrow, I should think she had as good a chance of happiness as if she were to be studying his character for a twelve-month. Happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. If the dispositions of the parties are ever so well known to each other, or ever so similar beforehand, it does not advance their felicity in the least. They always continue to grow sufficiently unlike afterwards to have their share of vexation, and it is better to know as little as possible of the defects of the person with whom you are to pass your life." You make me laugh, Charlotte, but it is not sound. You know it is not sound, and that you would never act in this way yourself." Occupied in observing Mr. Bingley's attentions to her sister, Elizabeth was far from suspecting that she was herself becoming an object of some interest in the eyes of his friend. Mr. Darcy had at first scarcely allowed her to be pretty. He had looked at her without admiration at the ball, and when they next met, he looked at her only to criticise. But no sooner had he made it clear to himself and his friends that she hardly had a good feature in her face, than he began to find it was rendered uncommonly intelligent by the beautiful expression of her dark eyes. To this discovery succeeded some others equally mortifying. Though he had detected with a critical eye more than one failure of perfect symmetry in her form, he was forced to acknowledge her figure to be light and pleasing and in spite of his asserting that her manners were not those of the fashionable world, he was caught by their easy playfulness. Of this she was perfectly unaware. To her he was only the man who made himself agreeable nowhere, and who had not thought her handsome enough to dance with. He began to wish to know more of her, and as a step towards conversing with her himself, attended to her conversation with others. His doing so drew her notice. It was at Sir William Lucas's, where a large party were assembled. "'What does Mr. Darcy mean,' said she to Charlotte, "'by listening to my conversation with Colonel Forster?' That is a question which Mr. Darcy only can answer. But if he does it any more, I shall certainly let him know that I see what he is about. He has a very satirical eye, and if I do not begin by being impertinent myself, I shall soon grow afraid of him." On his approaching them soon afterwards, though without seeming to have any intention of speaking, Miss Lucas defied her friend to mention such a subject to him, which immediately provoking Elizabeth to do it, she turned to him and said, did you not think, Mr. Darcy, that I expressed myself uncommonly well just now, when I was teasing Colonel Foster to give us a ball at Meryton? With great energy. But it is always a subject which makes a lady energetic. 
You are severe on us. It will be her turn soon to be teased, said Miss Lucas. I am going to open the instrument, Eliza, and you know what follows. You are a very strange creature by way of a friend, always wanting me to play and sing before anybody and everybody. If my vanity had taken a musical turn, you would have been invaluable. But as it is, I would really rather not sit down before those who must be in the habit of hearing the very best performers. On Miss Lucas's persevering, however, she added, "'Very well, if it must be so, it must.' And gravely glancing at Mr. Darcy, "'There is a fine old saying, which everybody here is of course familiar with, "'Keep your breath to cool your porridge, and I shall keep mine to swell my song.' Her performance was pleasing, though by no means capital. After a song or two, and before she could reply to the entreaties of several that she should sing again, she was eagerly succeeded at the instrument by her sister Mary, who, having in consequence of being the only plain one in the family, worked hard for her knowledge and accomplishments, was always impatient for display. Mary had neither genius nor taste, and though vanity had given her application, it had given her likewise a pedantic air and conceited manner, which would have injured a higher degree of excellence than she had reached. Elizabeth, easy and unaffected, had been listened to with much more pleasure, though not playing half so well, and Mary, at the end of a long concerto, was glad to purchase praise and gratitude by Scotch and Irish airs, at the request of her younger sisters, who, with some of the Lucases and two or three officers, joined eagerly in dancing at one end of the room. Mr. Darcy stood near them in silent indignation at such a mode of passing the evening, to the exclusion of all conversation, and was too much engrossed by his thoughts to perceive that Sir William Lucas was his neighbour, till Sir William thus began. "'What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy! There is nothing like dancing, after all. I consider it as one of the first refinements of polished society.' "'Certainly, sir. And it has the advantage also of being in vogue amongst the less polished societies of the world. Every savage can dance." Sir William only smiled. "'Your friend performs delightfully,' he continued, after a pause, on seeing Bingley join the group. "'And I doubt not that you are an adept in the science yourself, Mr. Darcy.' "'You saw me dance at Meryton, I believe, sir?' "'Yes, indeed, and received no inconsiderable pleasure from the sight. Do you often dance at St. James's?' "'Never, sir.' "'Do you not think it would be a proper compliment to the place?' It is a compliment which I never pay to any place, if I can avoid it. "'You have a house in town, I conclude?' Mr. Darcy bowed. "'I had once had some thought of fixing in town myself, for I am fond of superior society. But I did not feel quite certain that the air of London would agree with Lady Lucas.' He paused in hopes of an answer, but his companion was not disposed to make any and Elizabeth at that instant moving towards them, he was struck with the action of doing a very gallant thing, and called out to her, "'My dear Miss Eliza, why are you not dancing? Mr. Darcy, you must allow me to present this young lady to you as a very desirable partner. You cannot refuse to dance, I am sure, when so much beauty is before you.' And, taking her hand, he would have given it to Mr. Darcy, who, though extremely surprised, was not unwilling to receive it, when she instantly drew back, and said with some discomposure to Sir William, "'Indeed, sir, I have not the least intention of dancing. I entreat you not to suppose that I moved this way in order to beg for a partner.' Mr. Darcy, with grave propriety, requested to be allowed the honour of her hand, but in vain. Elizabeth was determined, nor did Sir William at all shake her purpose by his attempt at persuasion. "'You excel so much in the dance, Miss Eliza, that it is cruel to deny me the happiness of seeing you. And though this gentleman dislikes the amusement in general, he can have no objection, I am sure, to oblige us for one half-hour.' "'Mr. Darcy is all politeness,' said Elizabeth, smiling. "'He is indeed. But considering the inducement, my dear Miss Eliza, we cannot wonder at his complaisance. For who would object to such a partner?' Elizabeth looked archly, and turned away. Her resistance had not injured her with the gentleman, and he was thinking of her with some complacency, when thus accosted by Miss Bingley. "'I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not.' You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this matter, in such society. And indeed I am quite sure of your opinion. I was never more annoyed. The insipidity, and yet the noise, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of all these people! What would I give to hear your strictures on them? Your conjecture is totally wrong, I assure you. My mind was more agreeably engaged. I have been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can bestow. Miss Bingley immediately fixed her eyes on his face, and desired he would tell her what lady had the credit of inspiring such reflections. 
Mr. Darcy replied with great intrepidity, "'Miss Elizabeth Bennet.' "'Miss Elizabeth Bennet?' repeated Miss Bingley. "'I am all astonishment. How long has she been such a favourite? And pray, when am I to wish you joy?' "'That is exactly the question which I expected you to ask. A lady's imagination is very rapid. It jumps from admiration to love, from love to matrimony in a moment. I knew you would be wishing me joy. Nay, if you are serious about it, I shall consider the matter as absolutely settled. You will be having a charming mother-in-law, indeed, and, of course, she will always be at Pemberley with you.' He listened to her with perfect indifference while she chose to entertain herself in this matter and as his composure convinced her that all was safe, her wit flowed long. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Mr. Bennet's property consisted almost entirely in an estate of two thousand a year, which, unfortunately for his daughters, was entailed, in default of heirs male, on a distant relation and their mother's fortune, though ample for her situation in life, could but ill supply the deficiency of his. Her father had been an attorney in Meryton, and had left her four thousand pounds. She had a sister married to a Mr. Phillips, who had been a clerk to their father and succeeded him in the business, and a brother settled in London in a respectable line of trade. The village of Longbourn was only one mile from Meryton, a most convenient distance for the young ladies, who were usually tempted thither three or four times a week to pay their duty to their aunt, and to a milliner's shop just over the way. The two youngest of the family, Catherine and Lydia, were particularly frequent in these attentions. Their minds were more vacant than their sisters, and when nothing better offered, a walk to Meryton was necessary to amuse their morning hours and furnish conversation for the evening and however bare of news the country in general might be, they always contrived to learn some from their aunt. At present, indeed, they were well supplied with both news and happiness by the recent arrival of a militia regiment in the neighbourhood. It was to remain the whole winter, and Meryton was the headquarters. Their visits to Mrs. Phillips were now productive of the most interesting intelligence. Every day added something to their knowledge of the officers' names and connections. Their lodgings were not long a secret, and at length they began to know the officers themselves. Mr. Phillips visited them all, and this opened to his nieces a store of felicity unknown before. They could talk of nothing but officers, and Mr. Bingley's large fortune, the mention of which gave animation to their mother, was worthless in their eyes when opposed to the regimentals of an ensign. After listening one morning to their effusions on this subject, Mr. Bennet coolly observed, from all that I can collect by your manner of talking, you must be two of the silliest girls in the country. I have suspected it some time, but I am now convinced." Catherine was disconcerted and made no answer, but Lydia, with perfect indifference, continued to express her admiration of Captain Carter, and her hope of seeing him in the course of the day, as he was going the next morning to London. "'I am astonished, my dear,' said Mrs. Bennet, "'that you should be so ready to think your own children silly.' If I wish to think slightingly of anybody's children, it should not be my own, however. If my children are silly, I must hope to always be sensible of it. Yes, but as it happens, they are all of them very clever. This is the only point, I flatter myself, on which we do not agree. I had hoped that our sentiments coincided in every particular, but I must so far differ from you as to think our two youngest daughters uncommonly foolish. "'My dear Mr. Bennet, you must not expect such girls to have the sense of their father and mother. When they get to our age, I dare say they will not think about officers any more than we do. I remember the time when I liked a red coat myself very well, and indeed so I do still at my heart. And if a smart young colonel, with five or six thousand a year, should want one of my girls, I shall not say nay to him. And I thought Colonel Foster looked very becoming the other night at Sir William's in his regimentals.' Mamma cried Lydia. My aunt says that Colonel Foster and Captain Carter do not go so often to Miss Watson's as they did when they first came. She sees them now very often standing in Clark's library." Mrs. Bennet was prevented replying by the entrance of the footman with a note for Miss Bennet. It came from Netherfield, and the servant waited for an answer. Mrs. Bennet's eyes sparkled with pleasure, and she was eagerly calling out while her daughter read, "'Well, Jane, who is it from? What is it about? What does he say? Well, Jane, make haste and tell us. Make haste, my love. "'It is from Miss Bingley,' said Jane, and then read it aloud. "'My dear friend, if you are not so compassionate as to dine to-day with Louisa and me, we shall be in danger of hating each other for the rest of our lives, for a whole day's tete-a-tete -tete between two women can never end without a quarrel. 
Come as soon as you can on receipt of this. My brother and the gentleman are to dine with the officers. Yours ever, Caroline Bingley. With the officers? cried Lydia. I wonder my aunt did not tell us of that. Dining out, said Mrs. Bennet, that is very unlucky. Can I have the carriage? said Jane. No, my dear, you had better go on horseback, because it seems likely to rain, and then you must stay all night. That would be a good scheme, said Elizabeth, if you were sure that they would not offer to send her home. Oh, but the gentlemen will have Mr. Bingley's chaise to go to Meryton, and the Hursts have no horses to theirs. I had much rather go in the coach. But, my dear, your father cannot spare the horses, I am sure. They are wanted in the farm, Mr. Bennet, are they not? They are wanted in the farm much oftener than I can get them. But if you have got them to day, said Elizabeth, my mother's purpose will be answered. She did at last extort from her father an acknowledgment that the horses were engaged. Jane was therefore obliged to go on horseback, and her mother attended her to the door with many cheerful prognostics of a bad day. Her hopes were answered. Jane had not been gone long before it rained hard. Her sisters were uneasy for her, but her mother was delighted. The rain continued the whole evening without intermission. Jane certainly could not come back. This was a lucky idea of mine indeed, said Mrs. Bennet, more than once, as if the credit of making it rain were all her own. Till the next morning, however, she was not aware of all the felicity of her contrivance. Breakfast was scarcely over when a servant from Netherfield brought the following note for Elizabeth. My dearest Lizzie, I find myself very unwell this morning, which I suppose is to be imputed to my getting wet through yesterday. My kind friends will not hear of my returning till I am better. They insist also on my seeing Mr. Jones. Therefore do not be alarmed if you should hear of his having been to me, and, excepting a sore throat and headache, there is not much the matter with me. Yours, etc. Well, my dear, said Mr. Bennet, when Elizabeth had read the note aloud, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, if she should die, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. Oh, I am not afraid of her dying. People do not die of little trifling colds. She will be taken good care of. As long as she stays there, it is all very well. I would go and see her if I could have the carriage. Elizabeth, feeling really anxious, was determined to go to her, though the carriage was not to be had. And as she was no horsewoman, walking was her only alternative. She declared her resolution. How can you be so silly, cried her mother, as to think of such a thing in all this dirt? You will not be fit to be seen when you get there. I shall be very fit to see Jane, which is all I want. Is this a hint to me, Lizzie? said her father, to send for the horses? No, indeed. I do not wish to avoid the walk. The distance is nothing when one has a motive. Only three miles. I shall be back by dinner. I admire the activity of your benevolence, observed Mary, but every impulse of feeling should be guided by reason, and in my opinion exertion should always be in proportion to what is required. We will go as far as Meryton with you, said Catherine and Lydia. Elizabeth accepted their company, and the three young ladies set off together. If we make haste, said Lydia as they walked along, perhaps we may see something of Captain Carter before he goes. In Meryton they parted, the two youngest repaired to the lodgings of the officers' wives, and Elizabeth continued her walk alone, crossing field after field at a quick pace, jumping over stiles and springing over puddles with impatient activity, and finding herself at last within view of the house, with weary ankles, dirty stockings, and a face glowing with the warmth of exercise. She was shown into the breakfast parlour, where all but Jane were assembled, and where her appearance created a great deal of surprise. That she should have walked three miles so early in the day, in such dirty weather and by herself, was almost incredible to Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and Elizabeth was convinced that they held her in contempt for it. She was received, however, very politely by them, and in their brother's manners there was something better than politeness. There was good humour and kindness. Mr. Darcy said very little, and Mr. Hurst nothing at all. The former was divided between admiration of the brilliancy which exercise had given to her complexion, and doubt as to the occasions justifying her coming so far alone. The latter was thinking only of his breakfast. Her inquiries after his sister were not very favourably answered. Miss Bennet had slept ill, and though up, was very feverish, and not well enough to leave her room. Elizabeth was glad to be taken to her immediately, and Jane, who had only been withheld by the fear of giving alarm or inconvenience from expressing in her note how much she longed for such a visit, was delighted at her entrance. She was not equal, however, to much conversation, and when Miss Bingley left them together, could attempt little beside expressions of gratitude for the extraordinary kindness she was treated with. Elizabeth silently attended her. 
When breakfast was over they were joined by the sisters, and Elizabeth began to like them herself, when she saw how much affection and solicitude they showed for Jane. The apothecary came, and having examined his patient, said, as might be supposed, that she had caught a violent cold, and that they must endeavour to get the better of it, advised her to return to bed, and promised her some draughts. The advice was followed readily, for the feverish symptoms increased, and her head ached acutely. Elizabeth did not quit her room for a moment, nor were the other ladies often absent. The gentlemen being out, they had, in fact, nothing to do elsewhere. When the clock struck three, Elizabeth felt that she must go, and very unwillingly said so. Miss Bingley offered her the carriage, and she only wanted a little pressing to accept it, when Jane testified such concern in parting with her, that Miss Bingley was obliged to convert the offer of the chaise to an invitation to remain at Netherfield for the present. Elizabeth most thankfully consented, and a servant was dispatched to Longbourn to acquaint the family with her stay, and bring back a supply of clothes. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 At five o'clock the two ladies retired to dress, and at half-past six Elizabeth was summoned to dinner. To the civil inquiries which then poured in, and amongst which she had the pleasure of distinguishing the much superior solicitude of Mr. Bingley's, she could not make a very favourable answer. Jane was by no means better. The sisters, on hearing this, repeated three or four times how much they were grieved, how shocking it was to have a bad cold, and how excessively they disliked being ill themselves, and then thought no more of the matter, and their indifference towards Jane, when not immediately before them, restored Elizabeth to the enjoyment of all her former dislike. Their brother, indeed, was the only one of the party whom she could regard with any complacency. His anxiety for Jane was evident, and his attentions to herself most pleasing, and they prevented her feeling herself so much an intruder as she believed she was considered by the others. She had very little notice from any but him. Miss Bingley was engrossed by Mr. Darcy, her sister scarcely less so, and as for Mr. Hurst, by whom Elizabeth sat, he was an indolent man, who lived only to eat, drink, and play at cards, who, when he found her to prefer a plain dish to a ragout, had nothing to say to her. When dinner was over, she returned directly to Jane, and Miss Bingley began abusing her as soon as she was out of the room. Her manners were pronounced to be very bad indeed, a mixture of pride and impertinence. She had no conversation, no style, no beauty. Mrs. Hurst thought the same, and added, She has nothing, in short, to recommend her, but being an excellent walker. I shall never forget her appearance this morning. She really looked almost wild. She did indeed, Louisa. I could hardly keep my countenance. Very nonsensical to come at all. Why must she be scampering about the country, because her sister had a cold? Her hair, so untidy, so blousy! Yes, and her petticoat! I hope you saw her petticoat, six inches deep in mud, I am absolutely certain, and the gown which had been let down to hide it not doing its office. Your picture may be very exact, Louisa, said Bingley, but this was all lost upon me. I thought Miss Elizabeth Bennet looked remarkably well when she came into the room this morning. Her dirty petticoat quite escaped my notice. "'You observed it, Mr. Darcy, I am sure,' said Miss Bingley, "'and I am inclined to think that you would not wish to see your sister make such an exhibition.' "'Certainly not. "'To walk three miles, or four miles, or five miles, or whatever it is, "'above her ankles in dirt, and alone, quite alone, what could she mean by it? "'It seems to me to show an abominable sort of conceited independence, "'a most country-town indifference to decorum.' "'It shows an affection for her sister that is very pleasing,' said Bingley. "'I am afraid, Mr. Darcy,' observed Miss Bingley in a half-whisper, "'that this adventure has rather affected your admiration of her fine eyes.' "'Not at all,' he replied. "'They were brightened by the exercise.' A short pause followed this speech, and Mrs. Hurst began again. "'I have an excessive regard for Miss Jane Bennet. She is really a very sweet girl, and I wish with all my heart she were well settled. But with such a father and mother, and such low connections, I am afraid there is no chance of it.' "'I think I have heard you say that their uncle is an attorney on Meryton. "'Yes, and they have another who lives somewhere near Cheapside.' "'That is capital,' added her sister, and they both laughed heartily. "'If they had uncles enough to fill all Cheapside,' cried Bingley, "'it would not make them one jot less agreeable. "'But it must very materially lessen their chance of marrying men of any consideration in the world,' replied Darcy. "'To this speech Bingley made no answer.' but his sisters gave it their hearty assent, and indulged their mirth for some time at the expense of their dear friend's vulgar relations. With the renewal of tenderness, however, they returned to her room on leaving the dining-parlour, and sat with her till summoned to coffee. 
She was still very poorly, and Elizabeth would not quit her at all, till late in the evening, when she had the comfort of seeing her sleep, and when it seemed to her rather right than pleasant that she should go downstairs herself. On entering the drawing-room she found the whole party at loo, and was immediately invited to join them, but suspecting them to be playing high she declined it, and making her sister the excuse, said she would amuse herself for the short time she could stay below with a book. Mr. Hurst looks at her with astonishment. "'Do you prefer reading to cards?' said he. "'That is rather singular.' "'Miss Eliza Bennet,' said Miss Bingley, "'despises cards. She is a great reader, and has no pleasure in anything else.' "'I deserve neither such praise nor such censure,' cried Elizabeth. "'I am not a great reader, and I have pleasure in many things.' "'In nursing your sister, I am sure you have pleasure,' said Bingley, "'and I hope it will soon be increased by seeing her quite well.' Elizabeth thanked him from her heart, and then walked towards the table where a few books were lying. He immediately offered to fetch her others, all that his library afforded. "'And I wish my collection were larger for your benefit, and my own credit. But I am an idle fellow, and though I have not many, I have more than I have ever looked into.' Elizabeth assured him that she could suit herself perfectly with those in the room. "'I am astonished,' said Miss Bingley, "'that my father should have left so small a collection of books. What a delightful library you have at Pemberley, Mr. Darcy!' "'It ought to be good,' he replied. "'It has been the work of many generations. "'And then you have added so many to it yourself. "'You are always buying books.' "'I cannot comprehend the neglect of a family library in such days as these.' "'Neglect? "'I am sure you neglect nothing that can add to the beauties of that noble place. "'Charles, when you build your house, I wish it may be half as delightful as Pemberley.' "'I wish it may.' "'But I would really advise you to make your purchase in that neighbourhood, "'and take Pemberley for a kind of model.' There is not a finer county in England than Derbyshire. With all my heart, I will buy Pemberley itself if Darcy will sell it. I am talking of possibilities, Charles. Upon my word, Caroline, I should think it more possible to get Pemberley by purchase than by imitation. Elizabeth was so much caught with what passed as to leave her very little attention for her book, and soon laying it wholly aside, she drew near the card-table, and stationed herself between Mr. Bingley and his eldest sister to observe the game. "'Is Miss Darcy much grown since this spring?' said Miss Bingley. "'Will she be as tall as I am?' "'I think she will. She is now about Miss Elizabeth Bennet's height, or rather taller. How I long to see her again! I never met with anybody who delighted me so much. Such a countenance, such manners, and so extremely accomplished for her age. Her performance on the piano forte is exquisite.' "'It is amazing to me,' said Bingley, "'how young ladies can have patience to be so very accomplished as they all are.' "'All young ladies accomplished? My dear Charles, what do you mean?' "'Yes, all of them, I think. They all paint tables, cover screens, and net purses. I scarcely know any one who cannot do all this, and I am sure I never heard a young lady spoken of for the first time without being informed that she was very accomplished.' "'Your list of the common extent of accomplishments,' said Darcy, "'has too much truth. The word is applied to many a woman who deserves it no otherwise than by netting a purse or covering a screen.' but I am very far from agreeing with you in your estimation of ladies in general. I cannot boast of knowing more than half a dozen in the whole range of my acquaintance that are really accomplished. "'Nor I, I am sure,' said Miss Bingley. "'Then,' observed Elizabeth, "'you must comprehend a great deal in your idea of an accomplished woman.' "'Yes, I do comprehend a great deal in it.' "'Oh, certainly,' cried his faithful assistant. "'No one can be really esteemed accomplished who does not greatly surpass what is usually met with. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages, to deserve the word. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking, the tone of her voice, her address and expressions, or the word will be but half deserved.' "'All this she must possess,' added Darcy, "'and to all this she must yet add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. "'I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather wonder now at your knowing any. "'Are you so severe upon your own sex as to doubt the possibility of all this? "'I never saw such a woman. I never saw such capacity and taste and application and elegance, as you describe, united.' Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley both cried out against the injustice of her implied doubt, and both were protesting that they knew many women who answered this description, when Mr. Hurst called them to order with bitter complaints of their inattention to what was going forward. As all conversation was thereby at an end, Elizabeth soon afterwards left the room. "'Elizabeth Bennet,' said Miss Bingley, when the door was closed on her, "'is one of those young ladies who seek to recommend themselves to the other sex by undervaluing their own, and with many men, I dare say, it succeeds. 
but, in my opinion, it is a paltry device, a very mean art. Undoubtedly, replied Darcy, to whom this remark was chiefly addressed, there is a meanness in all the arts which ladies sometimes condescend to employ for captivation. Whatever bears affinity to cunning is despicable. Miss Bingley was not so entirely satisfied with this reply as to continue the subject. Elizabeth joined them again only to say that her sister was worse, and that she could not leave her. Bingley urged Mr. Jones being sent for immediately, while his sisters, convinced that no country advice could be of any service, recommended an express to town for one of the most eminent physicians. This she would not hear of, but she was not so unwilling to comply with their brother's proposal, and it was settled that Mr. Jones should be sent for early in the morning, if Miss Bennet were not decidedly better. Bingley was quite uncomfortable. His sisters declared that they were miserable. They solaced their wretchedness, however, by duets after supper, while he could find no better relief to his feelings than by giving the housekeeper directions that every attention might be paid to the sick lady and her sister. End of chapter 8、Chapter、nine. Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room. And in the morning had the pleasure of being able to send a tolerable answer to the inquiries which she very early received from Mr. Bingley by a housemaid, and some time afterwards from the two elegant ladies who waited on his sisters. In spite of this amendment, however, she requested to have a note sent to Longbourn, desiring her mother to visit Jane, and form her own judgment of her situation. The note was immediately dispatched, and its contents as quickly complied with. Mrs. Bennet, accompanied by her two youngest girls, reached Netherfield soon after the family breakfast. Had she found Jane in any apparent danger, Mrs. Bennet would have been very miserable. But being satisfied on seeing her that her illness was not alarming, she had no wish of her recovering immediately, as her restoration to health would probably remove her from Netherfield. She would not listen, therefore, to her daughter's proposal of being carried home. Neither did the apothecary, who arrived about the same time, think it at all advisable. After sitting a little while with Jane, on Miss Bingley's appearance and invitation, the mother and three daughters all attended her into the breakfast parlour. Bingley met them with hopes that Mrs. Bennet had not found Miss Bennet worse than she expected. Indeed, I have, sir, was her answer. She is a great deal too ill to be moved. Mr. Jones says we must not think of moving her. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness. Removed? cried Bingley. It must not be thought of. My sister, I am sure, will not hear of her removal. You may depend upon it, madam, said Miss Bingley with cold civility, that Miss Bennet will receive every possible attention while she remains with us. Mrs. Bennet was profuse in her acknowledgments. I am sure, she added, if it was not for such good friends, I do not know what would become of her, for she is very ill indeed, and suffers a vast deal, though with the greatest patience in the world, which is always the way with her, for she has, without exception, the sweetest temper I have ever met with. I often tell my other girls that they are nothing to her. You have a sweet room here, Mr. Bingley, and a charming prospect over the gravel walk. I do not know a place in the country that is equal to Netherfield. You will not think of quitting it in a hurry, I hope, though you have but a short lease. Whatever I do is done in a hurry, replied he, and therefore, if I should resolve to quit Netherfield, I should probably be off in five minutes. At present, however, I consider myself as quite fixed here. That is exactly what I should have supposed of you, said Elizabeth. You begin to comprehend me, do you? cried he, turning towards her. Oh, yes, I understand you perfectly. I wish I might take this for a compliment, but to be so easily seen through, I am afraid, is pitiful. That is as it happens. It does not follow that a deep, intricate character is more or less estimable than such a one as yours. Lizzie! cried her mother, remember where you are, and do not run on in the wild manner that you are suffered to do at home. I did not know before, continued Bingley immediately, that you were a studier of character. It must be an amusing study. Yes, but the intricate characters are the most amusing. They have at least that advantage. The country, said Darcy, can in general supply but a few subjects for such a study. In a country neighbourhood you move in a very confined and unvarying society. But people themselves alter so much that there is something new to be observed in them for ever. Yes, indeed, cried Mrs. Bennet, offended by his manner of mentioning a country neighbourhood. I assure you there is quite as much of that going on in the country as in town. Everybody was surprised, and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. Mrs. Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, continued her triumph. 
I cannot see that London has any great advantage over the country, for my part, except the shops and public places. The country is a vast deal pleasanter, is it not, Mr. Bingley?' "'When I am in the country,' he replied, "'I never wish to leave it. And when I am in town it is pretty much the same. They have each their advantages, and I can be equally happy in either. Ay, that is because you have the right disposition. But that gentleman—' looking at Darcy, seemed to think the country was nothing at all. "'Indeed, mamma, you are mistaken,' said Elizabeth, blushing for her mother. "'You quite mistook Mr. Darcy. He only meant that there was not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in the town, which you must acknowledge to be true.' "'Certainly, my dear. Nobody said there were. But as to not meeting with many people in this neighbourhood, I believe there are few neighbourhoods larger. I know we dine with four and twenty families.' Nothing but concern for Elizabeth could enable Bingley to keep his countenance. His sister was less delicate, and directed her eyes towards Mr. Darcy with a very expressive smile. Elizabeth, for the sake of saying something that might turn her mother's thoughts, now asked her if Charlotte Lucas had been at Longbourn since her coming away. "'Yes. She called yesterday with her father. What an agreeable man Sir William is, Mr. Bingley, is not he? So much the man of fashion, so genteel and easy. He had always something good to say to everybody. That is my idea of good breeding. And those persons who fancy themselves very important, and never open their mouths, quite mistake the matter. Did Charlotte dine with you? No, she would go home. I fancy she was wanted about the mince pies. For my part, Mr. Bingley, I always keep servants that can do their own work. My daughters are brought up very differently. But everybody is to judge for themselves, and the Lucases are a very good sort of girls, I assure you. It is a pity they are not handsome. Not that I think Charlotte so very plain, but then she is our particular friend. She seems a very pleasant young woman. Oh, dear, yes! But you must own that she is very plain. Lady Lucas herself has often said so, and envied me Jane's beauty. I do not like to boast of my own child, but to be sure, Jane, one does not often see anybody better looking. It is what everybody says. I do not trust my own partiality. When she was only fifteen there was a man at my brother Gardiner's in town, so much in love with her, that my sister-in-law was sure he would make her an offer before we came away. But, however, he did not. Perhaps he thought her too young. However, he wrote some verses on her, and very pretty they were." "'And so ended his affection,' said Elizabeth impatiently. "'There has been many a one, I fancy, overcome in the same way. I wonder who first discovered the efficacy of poetry in driving away love.' "'I have been used to consider poetry as the food of love,' said Darcy. "'Of a fine, stout, healthy love it may. Everything nourishes what is strong already. But if it be only a slight, thin sort of inclination, I am convinced that one good sonnet will starve it entirely away.' Darcy only smiled, and the general pause which ensued made Elizabeth tremble lest her mother should be exposing herself again. She longed to speak, but could think of nothing to say and after a short silence Mrs. Bennet began repeating her thanks to Mr. Bingley for his kindness to Jane, with an apology for troubling him also with Lizzie. Mr. Bingley was unaffectedly civil in his answer, and forced his younger sister to be civil also, and say what the occasion required. She performed her part indeed without much graciousness, but Mrs. Bennet was satisfied, and soon afterwards ordered her carriage. Upon this signal the youngest of her daughters put herself forward. The two girls had been whispering to each other during the whole visit, and the result of it was, that the youngest should tax Mr. Bingley with having promised on his first coming into the country to give a ball at Netherfield. Lydia was a stout, well-grown girl of fifteen, with a fine complexion and good-humoured countenance, a favourite with her mother, whose affection had brought her into public at an early age. She had high animal spirits, and a sort of natural self-consequence, which the attention of the officers, to whom her uncle's good dinners, and her own easy manners recommended her, had increased into assurance. She was very equal, therefore, to address Mr. Bingley on the subject of the ball, and abruptly reminded him of his promise, adding that it would be the most shameful thing in the world if he did not keep it. His answer to this sudden attack was delightful to their mother's ear. I am perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement, and when your sister is recovered you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. But you would not wish to be dancing when she is ill." Lydia declared herself satisfied. Oh, yes! It would be much better to wait till Jane was well, and by that time most likely Captain Carter would be at Meryton again. And when you have given your ball, she added, I shall insist on their giving one also. I shall tell Colonel Foster that it will be quite a shame if he does not. 
Mrs. Bennet and her daughters then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane, leaving her own and her relations' behaviour to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr. Darcy, the latter of whom, however, could not be prevailed on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bingley's witticisms on fine eyes. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The day passed much as the day before had done. Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley had spent some hours of the morning with the invalid, who continued, though slowly, to mend, and in the evening Elizabeth joined their party in the drawing-room. The loo-table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter, and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hurst and Mr. Bingley were at piquet, and Mrs. Hurst was observing their game. Elizabeth took up some needlework, and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady, either on his handwriting, or on the evenness of his lines, or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with which her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue, and was exactly in union with her opinion of each. "'How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter!' He made no answer. "'You write uncommonly fast.' "'You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. "'How many letters you must have occasion to write in the course of a year! "'Letters of business, too! How odious I should think them! "'It is fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of yours. "'Pray tell your sister that I long to see her. "'I have already told her so once, by your desire. "'I am afraid you do not like your pen. Let me mend it for you. "'I mend pens remarkably well. "'Thank you. But I always mend my own. "'How can you contrive to write so even?' he was silent. "'Tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table, and I think it infinitely superior to Miss Grantley's. Will you give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present I have not room to do them justice. Oh, it is of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy?' "'They are generally long.' but whether always charming it is not for me to determine. It is a rule with me, that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. "'That will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline,' cried her brother, "'because he does not write with ease. He studies too much for words of four syllables. Do not you, Darcy?' "'My style of writing is very different from yours.' "'Oh!' cried Miss Bingley. "'Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words and blots the rest.' My ideas flow so rapidly that I have not time to express them, by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondence. "'Your humility, Mr. Bingley,' said Elizabeth, "'must disarm reproof.' "'Nothing is more deceitful,' said Darcy, "'than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion, and sometimes an indirect boast. And which of the two do you call my little recent piece of modesty?' "'The indirect boast.' for you are really proud of your defects in writing, because you consider them as proceeding from a rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimable, you think at least highly interesting. The power of doing anything with quickness is always prized much by the possessor, and often without any attention to the imperfection of the performance. When you told Mrs. Bennet this morning, that if you ever resolved upon quitting Netherfield you should be gone in five minutes, you meant it to be a sort of panegyric, of compliment to yourself. And yet what is there so very laudable in the precipitance which must leave very necessary business undone, and can be of no real advantage to yourself or any one else? Nay, cried Bingley, this is too much to remember at night all the foolish things that were said in the morning. And yet upon my honour, I believe what I said of myself to be true, and I believe it at this moment. At least, therefore, I did not assume the character of needless precipitance merely to show off before the ladies. I dare say you believed it but I am by no means convinced that you would have gone with such celerity. Your conduct would be quite as dependent on chance as that of any man I know, and if, as you were mounting your horse, a friend were to say, Bingley, you had better stay till next week, you would probably do it. You would probably not go, and, at another word, might stay a month. You have only proved by this, cried Elizabeth, that Mr. Bingley did not do justice to his own disposition. You have shown him off now much more than he did himself." "'I am exceedingly gratified,' said Bingley, "'by your converting what my friend says into a compliment on the sweetness of my temper. 
but I am afraid you are giving it a turn which that gentleman did by no means intend. For he would certainly think better of me if, under such a circumstance, I were to give a flat denial, and ride off as fast as I could. Would Mr. Darcy then consider the rashness of your original intentions as atoned for by your obstinacy in adhering to it? Upon my word, I cannot exactly explain the matter. Darcy must speak for himself. You expect me to account for opinions which you choose to call mine, but which I have never acknowledged. Allowing the case, however, to stand according to your representation, you must remember, Miss Bennet, that the friend who is supposed to desire his return to the house, and the delay of his plan, has merely desired it asked it without offering one argument in favour of its propriety. To yield readily, easily, to the persuasion of a friend is no merit with you. To yield without conviction is no compliment to the understanding of either. You appear to me, Mr. Darcy, to allow nothing for the influence of friendship and affection. A regard for the requester would often make one yield readily to a request, without waiting for arguments to reason one into it. I am not particularly speaking of such a case as you have supposed about Mr. Bingley. We may as well wait, perhaps, till the circumstance occurs before we discuss the discretion of his behaviour thereupon. But in general and ordinary cases between friend and friend, where one of them is desired by the other to change a resolution of no very great moment, should you think ill of that person for complying with the desire without waiting to be argued into it? Will it not be advisable, before we proceed on this subject, to arrange with rather more precision the degree of importance which is to appertain to this request, as well as the degree of intimacy subsisting between the parties? By all means, cried Bingley, let us hear all the particulars, not forgetting their comparative height and size, for that will have more weight in the argument, Miss Bennet, than you may be aware of. I assure you, that if Darcy were not such a great tall fellow in comparison with myself, I should not pay him half so much deference. I declare I do not know a more awful object than Darcy, on particular occasions, and in particular places. At his own house especially, and of a Sunday evening, when he has nothing to do." Mr. Darcy smiled. But Elizabeth thought she could perceive that he was rather offended, and therefore checked her laugh. Miss Bingley warmly resented the indignity he had received, in an expostulation with her brother for talking such nonsense. "'I see your design, Bingley,' said his friend. "'You dislike an argument, and want to silence this.' "'Perhaps I do. Arguments are too much like disputes. If you and Miss Bennet will defer yours till I am out of the room, I shall be very thankful. And then you may say whatever you like of me.' "'What you ask,' said Elizabeth, "'is no sacrifice on my side, and Mr. Darcy had much better finish his letter.' Mr. Darcy took her advice, and did finish his letter. When that business was over, he applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth for an indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved with some alacrity to the pianoforte, and, after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way which the other as politely and more earnestly negatived, she seated herself. Mrs. Hurst sang with her sister, and while they were thus employed, Elizabeth could not help observing, as she turned over some music-books that lay on the instrument, how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that she could be an object of admiration to so great a man, and yet— that he should look at her because he disliked her was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, at last, that she drew his notice because there was something more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care for his approbation. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scotch air, and soon afterwards Mr. Darcy, drawing near Elizabeth, said to her, do not you feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question with some surprise at her silence. Oh, said she, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes, and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have therefore made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all. And now despise me if you dare." "'Indeed, I do not dare.' Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry. But there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner which made it difficult for her to affront anybody, and Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that, were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. Miss Bingley saw or suspected enough to be jealous, and her great anxiety for the recovery of her dear friend Jane received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. 
She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest, by talking of their supposed marriage, and planning his happiness in such an alliance. "'I hope,' said she, as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, "'you will give your mother-in-law a few hints, when this desirable event takes place, as to the advantage of holding her tongue. And if you can compass it, do cure the younger girls of running after officers. And if I may mention so delicate a subject, endeavour to check that little something bordering on conceit and impertinence which your lady possesses. "'Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity?' "'Oh, yes.' Do let the portraits of your uncle and aunt Phillips be placed in the gallery at Pemberley. Put them next to your great-uncle the judge. They are in the same profession, you know, only in different lines. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not have it taken, for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes? It would not be easy, indeed, to catch their expression. But their colour and shape, and the eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. At that moment they were met from another walk by Mrs. Hurst and Elizabeth herself. "'I did not know that you intended to walk,' said Miss Bingley, in some confusion, lest they had been overheard. "'You used us abominably ill,' answered Mrs. Hurst, running away without telling us that you were coming out. Then, taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness, and immediately said, "'This walk is not wide enough for our party. We had better go into the avenue.' But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, "'No, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped, and appear to uncommon advantage. The picturesque would be spoiled by admitting a fourth. Good-bye.' She then ran gaily off, rejoicing, as she rambled about, in the hope of being at home again in a day or two. Jane was already so much recovered as to intend leaving her room for a couple of hours that evening. End of chapter 10《ラブ》When the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister, and seeing her well guarded from cold, attended her into the drawing-room, where she was welcomed by her two friends with many professions of pleasure. And Elizabeth had never seen them so agreeable as they were during the hour which passed before the gentlemen appeared. Their powers of conversation were considerable. They could describe an entertainment with accuracy, relate an anecdote with humour, and laugh at their acquaintance with spirit. But when the gentlemen entered, Jane was no longer the first object. Miss Bingley's eyes were instantly turned toward Darcy, and she had something to say to him before he had advanced many steps. He addressed himself to Miss Bennet, with a polite congratulation. Mr. Hurst also made her a slight bow, and said he was very glad. But diffuseness and warmth remained for Bingley's salutation. He was full of joy and attention. The first half-hour was spent in piling up the fire, lest she should suffer from the change of room and she removed at his desire to the other side of the fireplace, that she might be further from the door. He then sat down by her, and talked scarcely to any one else. Elizabeth, at work in the opposite corner, saw it all with great delight. When tea was over, Mr. Hurst reminded his sister-in-law of the card-table, but in vain. She had obtained private intelligence that Mr. Darcy did not wish for cards, and Mr. Hurst soon found even his open petition rejected. She assured him that no one intended to play, and the silence of the whole party on the subject seemed to justify her. Mr. Hurst had therefore nothing to do but to stretch himself on one of the sofas and go to sleep. Darcy took up a book, Miss Bingley did the same, and Mrs. Hurst, principally occupied in playing with her bracelets and rings, joined now and then in her brother's conversation with Miss Bennet. Miss Bingley's attention was quite as much engaged in watching Mr. Darcy's progress through his book as in reading her own, and she was perpetually either making some inquiry or looking at his page. She could not win him, however, to any conversation. He merely answered her question and read on. At length, quite exhausted by the attempt to be amused with her own book, which she had only chosen because it was the second volume of his, she gave a great yawn and said, "'How pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way!' I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. How much sooner one tires of anything than of a book! When I have a house of my own, I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library." No one made any reply. She then yawned again, threw aside her book, and cast her eyes round the room in quest for some amusement. When hearing her brother mentioning a ball to Miss Bennet, she turned suddenly towards him and said, "'By the by, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Netherfield?' I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. 
I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball would be rather a punishment than a pleasure. If you mean Darcy, cried her brother, he may go to bed, if he chooses, before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing, and as soon as Nichols has made a white soup enough, I shall send round my cards. I should like balls infinitely better, she replied, if they were carried on in a different manner. But there is something insufferably tedious in the usual process of such a meeting. It would surely be much more rational if conversation instead of dancing were made the order of the day. Much more rational, my dear Caroline, I dare say. But it would not be near so much like a ball. Miss Bingley made no answer, and soon afterwards she got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant, and she walked well. But Darcy, at whom it was all aimed, was still inflexibly studious. In the desperation of her feelings, she resolved on one effort more, and turning to Elizabeth said, Miss Eliza Bennet, let me persuade you to follow my example and take a turn about the room. I assure you it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one attitude. Elizabeth was surprised, but agreed to it immediately. Miss Bingley succeeded no less in the real object of her civility. Mr. Darcy looked up. He was as much awake to the novelty of attention in that quarter as Elizabeth herself could be, and unconsciously closed his book. He was directly invited to join their party, but he declined it, observing that he could imagine but two motives for their choosing to walk up and down the room together, with either of which motives his joining them would interfere. What could he mean? She was dying to know what could be his meaning, and asked Elizabeth whether she could at all understand him. Not at all, was her answer, but depend upon it. He means to be severe on us, and our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. Miss Bingley, however, was incapable of disappointing Mr. Darcy in anything, and persevered, therefore, in requiring an explanation of his two motives. "'I have not the smallest objection to explaining them,' said he, as soon as she allowed him to speak. "'You either choose this method of passing the evening because you are in each other's confidence, and have secret affairs to discuss, or because you are conscious that your figures appear to the greatest advantage in walking. If the first, I would be completely in your way, and if the second, I can admire you much better as I sit by the fire.' "'Oh, shocking!' cried Miss Bingley. "'I never heard anything so abominable. How shall we punish him for such a speech?' "'Nothing so easy, if you have but the inclination,' said Elizabeth. "'We can all plague and punish one another. Tease him. Laugh at him. Intimate as you are, you must know how it is to be done.' "'But upon my honour I do not. I do assure you that my intimacy has not yet taught me that. Tease calmness of temper and presence of mind? No, no. I feel he may defy us there.' And as to laughter, we will not expose ourselves, if you please, by attempting to laugh without a subject. Mr. Darcy may hug himself." "'Mr. Darcy is not to be laughed at,' cried Elizabeth. "'That is an uncommon advantage, and uncommon I hope it will continue, for it would be a great loss to me to have many such acquaintances. I dearly love a laugh.' "'Miss Bingley,' said he, "'has given me credit for more than can be. The wisest and the best of men, nay, the wisest and the best of their actions may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, replied Elizabeth, there are such people, but I hope I am not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise or good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can. But these, I suppose, are precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for any one. But it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule. Such as vanity and pride? Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed. But pride, where there is a real superiority of mind, pride will always be under good resolution." Elizabeth turned away to hide a smile. "'Your examination of Mr. Darcy is over, I presume,' said Miss Bingley. "'And pray, what is the result?' I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr. Darcy has no defect. He owns it to himself without disguise." No, said Darcy, I have made no such pretension. I have thoughts enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My temper I dare not vouch for. It is, I believe, too little yielding, certainly too little for the convenience of the world. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others so soon as I ought, nor their offences against myself. My feelings are not puffed about with every attempt to move them. My temper would perhaps be called resentful. My good opinion, once lost, is lost for ever." "'That is a failing indeed,' cried Elizabeth. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character. But you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at it. You are safe from me." 
There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is a propensity to hate everybody. And yours, he replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. Do let us have a little music, cried Miss Bingley, tired of a conversation in which she had no share. Louisa, you will not mind my waking Mr. Hurst? Her sister made not the slightest objection, and the pianoforte was opened, and Darcy, after a few moments' recollection, was not sorry for it. He began to feel the danger of paying Elizabeth too much attention. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve. In consequence of an agreement between the sisters, Elizabeth wrote the next morning to her mother, to beg that the carriage might be sent for them in the course of the day. But Mrs. Bennet, who had calculated on her daughter's remaining at Netherfield till the following Tuesday, which would exactly finish Jane's week, could not bring herself to receive them with pleasure before. Her answer, therefore, was not propitious, at least not to Elizabeth's wishes, for she was impatient to get home. Mrs. Bennet sent them word that they could not possibly have the carriage before Tuesday, and in her postscript it was added that if Mr. Bingley and his sister pressed them to stay longer, she could spare them very well. Against staying longer, however, Elizabeth was positively resolved. Nor did she much expect it would be asked, and fearful, on the contrary, as being considered as intruding themselves needlessly long, she urged Jane to borrow Mr. Bingley's carriage immediately and at length it was settled that their original design of leaving Netherfield that morning should be mentioned, and the request made. The communication excited many professions of concern, and enough was said of wishing them to stay at least until the following day, to work on Jane, until the morrow their going was deferred. Miss Bingley was then sorry that she had proposed the delay, for her jealousy and dislike of one sister much exceeded her affection for the other. The master of the house heard with real sorrow that they were to go so soon, and repeatedly tried to persuade Miss Bennet that it would not be safe for her, that she was not enough recovered, but Jane was firm where she felt herself to be right. To Mr. Darcy it was welcome intelligence. Elizabeth had been at Netherfield long enough. She attracted him more than he liked, and Miss Bingley was uncivil to her, and more teasing than usual to himself. He wisely resolved to be particularly careful that no sign of admiration should now escape him, nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influencing his felicity, sensible that, if such an idea had been suggested, his behaviour during the last day must have material weight in confirming or crushing it. Steady to his purpose, he scarcely spoke ten words to her through the whole of Saturday, and though they were at one time left by themselves for half an hour, he adhered most conscientiously to his book, and would not even look at her. On Sunday, after morning service, the separation so agreeable to almost all took place. Miss Bingley's civility to Elizabeth increased at last very rapidly, as well as her affection for Jane, and when they parted, after assuring the latter of the pleasure it would give her to see her either at Longbourn or Netherfield, and embracing her most tenderly, she even shook hands with the former. Elizabeth took leave of the whole party in the liveliest spirits. They were not welcomed home very cordially by their mother. Mrs. Bennet wondered at their coming, and thought them very wrong to give so much trouble, and was sure Jane would have caught cold again. But their father, though very laconic in his expressions of pleasure, was really glad to see them. He had felt their importance in the family circle. The evening conversation, when they were all assembled, had lost much of its animation, and almost all its sense, by the absence of Jane and Elizabeth. They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of thorough base and human nature, and had some new extracts to admire, and some new observations of threadbare morality to listen to. Catherine and Lydia had information for them of a different sort. Much had been done, and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle, a private had been flogged, and it had actually been hinted that Colonel Foster was going to be married. End of chapter 12 Chapter Thirteen. I hope, my dear, said Mr. Bennet to his wife, as they were at breakfast the next morning, that you have ordered a good dinner to-day, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. What do you mean, my dear? I know of nobody that is coming, I am sure, unless Charlotte Lucas should happen to call in, and I am sure my dinners are good enough for her. I do not believe she often sees such at home. The person of whom I speak is a gentleman and a stranger. Mrs. Bennet's eyes sparkled. "'A gentleman and a stranger! It is Mr. Bingley, I am sure. 
"'Well, I am sure I shall be extremely glad to see Mr. Bingley. But, good Lord, how unlucky! There is not a bit of fish to be got to-day. Lydia, my love, ring the bell. I must speak to Hill this moment.' "'It is not Mr. Bingley,' said her husband. "'It is a person whom I never saw in the whole course of my life.' This roused a general astonishment, and he had the pleasure of being eagerly questioned by his wife and his five daughters at once. After amusing himself some time with their curiosity, he thus explained. "'About a month ago I received this letter, and about a fortnight ago I answered it, for I thought it a cause of some delicacy, and requiring early attention.' It is from my cousin, Mr. Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. "'Oh, my dear,' cried his wife, "'I cannot bear to hear that mentioned. Pray do not talk of that odious man. I do think it is the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children. I am sure, if I had been you, I should have tried long ago to do something or other about it.' Jane and Elizabeth tried to explain to her the nature of an entail. They had often attempted to do it before but it was a subject on which Mrs. Bennet was beyond the reach of reason, and she continued to rail bitterly against the cruelty of settling an estate away from a family of five daughters, in favour of a man whom nobody cared anything about. "'It certainly is a most iniquitous affair,' said Mr. Bennet, "'and nothing can clear Mr. Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longbourn. But if you will listen to his letter, you may perhaps be a little softened by his manner of expressing himself.' "'No, that I am sure I shall not.' and I think it is very impertinent of him to write to you at all, and very hypocritical. I hate such false friends. Why could he not keep on quarrelling with you, as his father did before him? Why, indeed? He does seem to have had some filial scruples on that head, as you will hear. Hunsford, near Westrum, Kent, 15th October. Dear Sir, The disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honoured father always gave me much uneasiness, and since I have had the misfortune to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach, but for some time I was kept back by my own doubts, fearing lest it might seem disrespectful to his memory for me to be on good terms with any one with whom it had always pleased him to be at variance. There, Mrs. Bennet. My mind, however, is now made up on the subject. For having received ordination at Easter, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of the right honourable Lady Catherine de Bourgh, widow of Sir Louis de Bourgh, whose bounty and beneficence has preferred me to the valuable rectory of this parish, where it shall be my earnest endeavour to demean myself with grateful respect towards her ladyship, and be ever ready to perform those rites and ceremonies which are instituted by the Church of England. As a clergyman, moreover, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within the reach of my influence, and on these grounds I flatter myself that my present overtures are highly recommendable, and that the circumstance of my being next in the entail of Longbourn estate will be kindly overlooked on your side, and not lead you to reject the offered olive branch. I cannot be otherwise than concerned at being the means of injuring your amiable daughters, and beg leave to apologise for it, as well as to assure you of my readiness to make them every possible amends, but of this hereafter. If you should have no objection to receive me into your house, I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family, Monday, November 18th, by four o'clock, and shall probably trespass on your hospitality till the Saturday Senight following which I can do without any inconvenience, as Lady Catherine is far from objecting to my occasional absence on a Sunday, provided that some other clergyman is engaged to do the duty of the day. I remain, dear sir, with respectful compliments to your lady and daughters, your well-wisher and friend, William Collins. At four o'clock, therefore, we may expect this peace-making gentleman, said Mr. Bennet, as he folded up the letter. He seems to be a most conscientious and polite young man, upon my word and I doubt not will prove a valuable acquaintance, especially if Lady Catherine should be so indulgent as to let him come to us again. There is some sense in what he says about the girls, however, and if he is disposed to make them any amends, I shall not be the person to discourage him. Though it is difficult, said Jane, to guess in what way he can mean to make us the atonement he thinks our due, the wish is certainly to his credit. Elizabeth was chiefly struck by his extraordinary deference for Lady Catherine, and his kind intention of christening, marrying, and burying his parishioners whenever it were required. "'He must be an oddity, I think,' said she. "'I cannot make him out. There is something very pompous in his style. And what can he mean by apologising for being next in the entail? We cannot suppose he would help it if he could. Could he be a sensible man, sir?' "'No, my dear, I think not.' I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. 
There is a mixture of servility and self-importance in his letter, which promises well. I am impatient to see him. In point of composition, said Mary, the letter does not seem defective. The idea of the olive branch, perhaps, is not wholly new, yet I think it is well expressed. To Catherine and Lydia neither the letter nor its writer were in any degree interesting. It was next to impossible that their cousin should come in a scarlet coat, and it was now some weeks since they had received pleasure from the society of a man in any other colour. As for their mother, Mr. Collins's letter had done away with much of her ill-will, and she was preparing to see him with a degree of composure which astonished her husband and daughters. Mr. Collins was punctual to his time, and was received with great politeness by the whole family. Mr. Bennet, indeed, said little, but the ladies were ready enough to talk, and Mr. Collins seemed neither in need of encouragement nor inclined to be silent himself. He was a tall, heavy-looking young man of five-and-twenty. His air was grave and stately, and his manners were very formal. He had not been long seated before he complimented Mrs. Bennet on having so fine a family of daughters, said he had heard much of their beauty, but that in this instance fame had fallen short of the truth, and added that he did not doubt her seeing them all in due time disposed of in marriage. This gallantry was not much to the taste of some of his hearers, but Mrs. Bennet, who quarrelled with no compliments, answered most readily, "'You are very kind, I am sure, and I wish with all my heart it may prove so, for else they will be destitute enough. Things are settled so oddly. You allude, perhaps, to the entail of this estate. Ah, sir, I do indeed. It is a grievous affair to my poor girls, you must confess. Not that I mean to find fault with you, for such things I know are all chance in this world. There is no knowing how estates will go once they come to be entailed.' I am very sensible, madam, to the hardship of my fair cousins, and could say much on the subject, but that I am cautious of appearing forward and precipitate. But I can assure the young ladies that I come prepared to admire them. At present I will not say more, but perhaps when we are better acquainted— He was interrupted by a summons to dinner, and the girls smiled on each other. They were not the only objects of Mr. Collins' admiration. The hall, the dining-room, and all its furniture were examined and praised, and his commendation of everything would have touched Mrs. Bennet's heart, but for the mortifying supposition of his viewing it all as his own future property. The dinner, too, in its turn, was highly admired, and he begged to know to which of his fair cousins the excellency of its cooking was owing. But he was set right there by Mrs. Bennet, who assured him with some asperity that they were very well able to keep a cook, and that her daughters had nothing to do in the kitchen. He begged pardon for having displeased her. In a softened tone she declared herself not at all offended, but he continued to apologise for about a quarter of an hour. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 During dinner Mr. Bennet scarcely spoke at all, but when the servants were withdrawn he thought it time to have some conversation with his guest, and therefore started a subject in which he expected him to shine, by observing that he seemed very fortunate in his patroness. Lady Catherine de Bourgh's attention to his wishes, and consideration for his comfort, appeared very remarkable. Mr. Bennet could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise. The subject elevated him to more than usual solemnity of manner, and with a most important aspect he protested that he had never in his life witnessed such behaviour in a person of rank, such affability and condescension, as he had himself experienced from Lady Catherine. She had been graciously pleased to approve of both of the discourses which he had already had the honour of preaching before her. She had also asked him twice to dine at Rosings, and had sent for him only the Saturday before, to make up her pool of quadrille in the evening. Lady Catherine was reckoned proud by many people he knew, but he had never seen anything but affability in her. She had always spoken to him as she would to any other gentleman. She made not the smallest objection to his joining in the society of the neighbourhood, nor to his leaving the parish occasionally for a week or two to visit his relations. She had even condescended to advise him to marry as soon as he could, provided he chose with discretion, and had once paid him a visit in his humble parsonage, where she had perfectly approved all the alterations he had been making, and had even vouchsafed to suggest some herself, some shells in the closet upstairs. "'That is all very proper and civil, I am sure,' said Mrs. Bennet, "'and I dare say she is a very agreeable woman. It is a pity that great ladies in general are not more like her. Does she live near you, sir?' 
The garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from Rosings Park, her ladyship's residence. I think you said she was a widow, sir. Has she any family? She has only one daughter, the heiress of Rosings, and a very extensive property. Ah, said Mrs. Bennet, shaking her head, then she is better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? She is a most charming young lady indeed. Lady Catherine herself says that, in point of true beauty, Mr. Berg is far superior to the handsomest of her sex, because there is that in her features which marks the young lady of distinguished birth. She is unfortunately of a sickly constitution, which has prevented her from making that progress in many accomplishments, which she could not have otherwise failed of, as I am informed by the lady who superintended her education, and who still resides with them. But she is perfectly amiable, and often condescends to drive by my humble abode in her little phaeton and ponies. Has she been presented? I do not remember her name among the ladies at court. Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town, and by that means, as I told Lady Catherine one day, has deprived the British court of its brightest ornaments. Her ladyship seemed pleased with the idea, and you may imagine that I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. I have more than once observed to Lady Catherine that her charming daughter seemed born to be a duchess, and that the most elevated rank, instead of giving her consequence, would be adorned by her. These are the kind of little things which please her ladyship, and it is a sort of attention which I conceive myself peculiarly bound to pay. "'You judge very properly,' said Mr. Bennet, "'and it is happy for you that you possess the talent of flattering with delicacy. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment, or are the result of previous study?' They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, and though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may it be adapted to ordinary occasions, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible." Mr. Bennet's expectations were fully answered. His cousin was as absurd as he had hoped, and he listened to him with the keenest enjoyment, maintaining at the same time the most resolute composure of countenance, and, except in an occasional glance at Elizabeth, requiring no partner in his pleasure. By tea-time, however, the dose had been enough, and Mr. Bennet was glad to take his guest into the drawing-room again, and, when tea was over, glad to invite him to read aloud to the ladies. Mr. Collins readily assented, and a book was produced, but, on beholding it, for everything announced it to be from a circulating library, he started back, and, begging pardon, protested that he never read novels. Kitty stared at him, and Lydia exclaimed. Other books were produced, and after some deliberation he chose Fordyce's Sermons. Lydia gaped as he opened the volume, and before he had, with very monotonous solemnity, read three pages, she interrupted him with— do you know, mamma, that my uncle Phillips talks of turning away Richard? And if he does, Colonel Foster will hire him. My aunt told me so herself on Saturday. I shall walk to Meryton to-morrow to hear more about it, and to ask when Mr. Denny comes back from town." Lydia was bid by her two eldest sisters to hold her tongue, but Mr. Collins, much offended, laid aside his book and said, "'I have often observed how little young ladies are interested by books of a serious stamp, though written solely for their benefit. It amazes me, I confess, for certainly there can be nothing so advantageous to them as instruction. But I will no longer importune my young cousin.' Then, turning to Mr. Bennet, he offered himself as his antagonist at backgammon. Mr. Bennet accepted the challenge, observing that he acted very wisely in leaving the girls to their own trifling amusements. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters apologised most civilly for Lydia's interruption, and promised that it should not occur again, if he would resume his book. But Mr. Collins, after assuring them that he bore his young cousin no ill-will, and should never resent her behaviour as any affront, seated himself at another table with Mr. Bennet, and prepared for backgammon. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15. Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society. 
the greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of an illiterate and miserly father, and though he belonged to one of the universities, he had merely kept the necessary terms, without forming at it any useful acquaintance. The subjection in which his father had brought him up had given him originally great humility of manner, but it was now a good deal counteracted by the self-conceit of a weak head, living in retirement, and the consequential feelings of early and unexpected prosperity. A fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, when the living of Hunsford was vacant, and the respect which he felt for her high rank, and his veneration for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his right as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance and humility. Having now a good house, and a very sufficient income, he intended to marry, and in seeking a reconciliation with the Longbourn family, he had a wife in view, as he meant to choose one of the daughters, if he found them as handsome and amiable as they were represented by common report. This was his plan of amends, of atonement, for inheriting their father's estate, and he thought it an excellent one, full of eligibility and suitableness, and excessively generous and disinterested on his own part. His plan did not vary on seeing them. Miss Bennet's lovely face confirmed his views, and established all his strictest notions of what was due to seniority, and for the first evening she was his settled choice. The next morning, however, made an alteration for in a quarter of an hour's tete-a-tete -tete with Mrs. Bennet, before breakfast, a conversation beginning with his parsonage-house, and leading naturally to the avowal of his hopes, that a mistress might be found for it at Longbourn, produced from her, amid very complacent smiles and general encouragement, a caution against the very Jane he had fixed on. As to her younger daughters, she could not take upon her to say, she could not positively answer, but she did not know of any prepossession. Her eldest daughter, she must just mention, she felt it incumbent on her to hint, was likely to be very soon engaged. Mr. Collins had only to change from Jane to Elizabeth, and it was soon done, done while Mrs. Bennet was stirring the fire. Elizabeth, equal next to Jane in birth and beauty, succeeded her, of course. Mrs. Bennet treasured up the hint, and trusted that she might soon have two daughters married, and the man whom she could not bear to speak of the day before, was now high in her good graces. Lydia's intention of walking to Meryton was not forgotten. Every sister except Mary agreed to go with her, and Mr. Collins was to attend them, at the request of Mr. Bennet, who was most anxious to get rid of him, and have his library to himself. For thither Mr. Collins had followed him after breakfast, and there he would continue, nominally engaged with one of the largest folios in the collection, but really talking to Mr. Bennet with little cessation of his house and garden at Hunsford. Such doings discomposed Mr. Bennet exceedingly. In his library he had been always sure of leisure and tranquillity, and though prepared, as he told Elizabeth, to meet with folly and conceit in every other room of the house, he was used to be free from them there. His civility, therefore, was most prompt in inviting Mr. Collins to join his daughters in their walk, and Mr. Collins, being in fact much better fitted for a walker than a reader, was extremely pleased to close his large book and go. In pompous nothings on his side, and civil assents on that of his cousins, their time passed till they entered Meryton. The attention of the younger ones was then no longer to be gained by him. Their eyes were immediately wandering up in the street in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet indeed, or a really new muslin in a shop window, could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man, whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance, walking with another officer on the other side of the way. The officer was the very Mr. Denny, concerning whose return from London Lydia came to inquire, and he bowed as they passed. All were struck with the stranger's air. All wondered who he could be, and Kitty and Lydia, determined if possible to find out, led the way across the street, under pretence of wanting something in an opposite shop, and fortunately had just gained the pavement when the two gentlemen, turning back, had reached the same spot. Mr. Denny addressed them directly, and entreated permission to introduce his friend, Mr. Wickham, who had returned with him the day before from town, and he was happy to say had accepted a commission in their corps. This was exactly as it should be for the young man wanted only regimentals to make him completely charming. His appearance was greatly in his favour. He had all the best part of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing address. The introduction was followed up on his side by a happy readiness of conversation, a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party was still standing and talking together very agreeably, when the sound of horses drew their notice, and Darcy and Bingley were seen riding down the street. 
On distinguishing the ladies of the group, the two gentlemen came directly towards them, and began the usual civilities. Bingley was the principal spokesman, and Miss Bennet the principal object. He was then, he said, on his way to Longbourn on purpose to inquire after her. Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth, when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger, and Elizabeth, happening to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other, was all astonishment at the effect of the meeting. Both changed colour. One looked white, the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat, a salutation which Mr. Darcy just deigned to return. What could be the meaning of it? It was impossible to imagine. It was impossible not to long to know. In another minute Mr. Bingley, but without seeming to have noticed what passed, took leave and rode on with his friend. Mr. Denny and Mr. Wickham walked with the young ladies to the door of Mr. Phillips's house, and then made their bows, in spite of Miss Lydia's pressing entreaties that they should come in, and even in spite of Mrs. Phillips throwing up the parlour window and loudly seconding the invitation. Mrs. Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest, from their recent absence, were particularly welcome, and she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home, which, as their own carriage had not fetched them, she should have known nothing about, if she had not happened to see Mr. Jones' shop-boy in the street, who had told her that they were not to send any more draughts to Netherfield, because the Miss Bennets were come away, when her civility was claimed towards Mr. Collins by Jane's introduction of him. She received him with her very best politeness, which he returned with as much more, apologising for his intrusion without any previous acquaintance with her, which he could not help flattering himself, however, might be justified by his relationship to the young ladies who introduced him to her notice. Mrs. Phillips was quite awed by such an excess of good breeding, but her contemplation of one stranger was soon put to an end by exclamations and inquiries about the other, of whom, however, she could only tell her nieces what they already knew that Mr. Denny had brought him from London, and that he was to have a lieutenant's commission in the shire. She had been watching him the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street, and had Mr. Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would certainly have continued the occupation. But unluckily no one passed the windows now except a few of the officers, who, in comparison with the stranger, were become stupid, disagreeable fellows. Some of them were to dine with the Phillipses the next day, and their aunt promised to make her husband call on Mr. Wickham, and give him an invitation also, if the family from Longbourn would come in the evening. This was agreed to, and Mrs. Phillips protested that they would have a nice, comfortable, noisy game of lottery tickets, and a little bit of hot supper afterwards. The prospect of such delights was very cheering, and they parted in mutual good spirits. Mr. Collins repeated his apologies in quitting the room, and was assured with unwearying civility that they were perfectly needless. As they walked home, Elizabeth related to Jane what she had seen pass between the two gentlemen. But though Jane would have defended either or both, had they appeared to be in the wrong, she could no more explain such behaviour than her sister. Mr. Collins, on his return, highly gratified Mrs. Bennet by admiring Mrs. Phillips's manners and politeness. He protested that, except Lady Catherine and her daughter, he had never seen a more elegant woman. For she had not only received him with the utmost civility, but even pointedly included him in her invitation for the next evening, although utterly unknown to her before. Something, he supposed, might be attributed to his connection with them, but yet he had never met with so much attention the whole course of his life. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen. As no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr. Collins's scruples of leaving Mr. and Mrs. Bennet for a single evening during his visit were most steadily resisted, the coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Meryton, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing-room, that Mr. Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation, and was then in the house. When this information was given, and they had all taken their seats, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment, that he declared he might almost have supposed himself in the small summer breakfast-parlour at Rosings, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification. But when Mrs. Phillips understood from him what Rosings was, and who was its proprietor, when she had listened to the description of only one of Lady Catherine's drawing-rooms, and found that the chimney-piece alone had cost eight hundred pounds, she felt all the force of the compliment, and would hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, with occasional digressions in praise of his own humble abode, and the improvements it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentlemen joined them. 
and he found in Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it all among her neighbours as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but to wish for an instrument, and examine their own indifferent imitations of china on the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt that she had neither been seeing him before, nor thinking of him since, with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the shire were in general a very creditable, gentlemanlike set, and the best of them were of the present party, but Mr. Wickham was as far beyond them all in person, countenance, air, and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing port wine, who followed them into the room. Mr. Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself, and the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night, made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair as Mr. Wickham and the officers, Mr. Collins seemed to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies he certainly was nothing. But he had still, at intervals, a kind listener in Mrs. Phillips, and was, by her watchfulness, most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffin. When the card-tables were placed, he had the opportunity of obliging her in turn, by sitting down to whist. "'I know little of the game at present,' said he. "'But I shall be glad to improve myself, for in my situation in life—' Mrs. Phillips was very glad for his compliance, but could not wait for his reason. Mr. Wickham did not play at whist and with ready delight was he received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker, but being likewise extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes to have attention for any one in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear she could not hope to be told—the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was for Meryton, and after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. "'About a month,' said Elizabeth, and then, unwilling to let the subject drop, added, "'He is a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand.' "'Yes,' replied Mr. Wickham. "'His estate there is a noble one. A clear ten thousand per annum. You could not have met with a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, for I have been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy.' Elizabeth could not but look surprised. You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as you probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy?" "'As much as I ever wish to be,' cried Elizabeth very warmly. I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable." "'I have no right to give my opinion,' said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I am not qualified to form one. I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It is impossible for me to be impartial, but I believe your opinion of him would in general astonish, and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else. Here you are in your own family." "'Upon my word! I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighbourhood, except Netherfield. He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everybody is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favourably spoken of by any one." "'I cannot pretend to be sorry,' said Wickham, after a short interruption that he or that any man should not be estimated beyond their deserts. But with him, I believe, it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man." Wickham only shook his head. "'I wonder,' said he, at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he is likely to be in this country much longer. I do not at all know. But I heard nothing of his going away when I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans in favour of the Shire will not be affected by his being in the neighbourhood?" "'Oh, no! It is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him, 
but I have no reason for avoiding him, but what I might proclaim before all the world, a sense of a very great ill-usage, and most painful regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men that ever breathed, and the truest friend I ever had. And I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behaviour to myself has been scandalous, but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything, rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgracing the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increase, and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented further inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighbourhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, and speaking of the latter with gentle but very intelligible gallantry. It was the prospect of constant society, and good society, he added, which was my chief inducement to enter the shire. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable corps, and my friend Denny tempted me further by his account of their present quarters, and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintances Meryton had procured them. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment and society. A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in possession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now." Indeed. Yes. The late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of the best living in his gift. He was my godfather, and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide for me amply, and thought he had done it, but when the living fell it was given elsewhere." "'Good heavens!' cried Elizabeth. "'But how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did you not seek legal redress?' There was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honour could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it or to treat it as a merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was of an age to hold it, and that it was given to another man. And no less certain is it, that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper and I may have spoken my opinion of him and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is, that we are very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other he will be, but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him." Elizabeth honoured him for such feelings, and thought him handsomer than ever as he expressed them. But what, said she after a pause, can have been his motive? What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough determined dislike of me, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better. But his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given to me. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this, though I have never liked him. I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him to be despising his fellow-creatures in general, but I did not suspect him of descending to such malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumanity as this." After a few minutes' reflection, however, she continued, "'I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the implacability of his resentments, of his having an unforgiving temper. His disposition must be dreadful." "'I will not trust myself on the subject,' replied Wickham. "'I can hardly be just to him.' Elizabeth was again deep in thought, and after a time exclaimed, "'To treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favourite of his father!' She could have added, "'A young man, too, like you, whose very countenance may vouch for your being amiable.' But she contented herself with, and one, too, who had probably been his companion from childhood, connected together, as I think you said, in the closest manner. We were born in the same parish, within the same park. The greatest part of our youth was passed together, inmates of the same house, sharing the same amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession which your uncle, Mr. Phillips, appears to do so much credit to. 
but he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy, and devoted all his time to the care of the Pemberley property. He was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most intimate confidential friend. Mr. Darcy often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest obligations to my father's active superintendence, and when, immediately before my father's death, Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me, I am convinced that he felt it to be as much a debt of gratitude to him as of his affection to myself." "'How strange!' cried Elizabeth. "'How abominable! I wonder that the very pride of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to you. If from no better motive that he should not have been too proud to be dishonest, for dishonesty I must call it." "'It is wonderful,' replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride had often been his best friend. It has connected him nearer with virtue than with any other feeling. But we are none of us consistent, and in his behaviour to me there were stronger impulses even than pride." "'Can such abominable pride as his have ever done him good?' "'Yes. It has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor. Family pride and filial pride, for he is very proud of what his father was, have done this not to appear to disgrace his family, to degenerate from the popular qualities, or lose the influence of the Pemberley House, is a powerful motive. He has also brotherly pride, which with some brotherly affection makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you will hear him generally cried up as the most attentive and best of brothers. What sort of girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy. But she is too much like her brother, very, very proud. As a child she was affectionate and pleasing, and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. But she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about fifteen or sixteen, and, I understand, highly accomplished. Since her father's death her home has been London, where a lady lives with her, and superintends her education. After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first, and saying, "'I am astonished at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley. How can Mr. Bingley, who seems good humour itself, and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not. But Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can be a conversable companion if he thinks it worth his while. Among those who are at all his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him. But with the rich he is liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honourable, and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered round the other table, and Mr. Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mrs. Phillips. The usual inquiries as to his success were made by the latter. It had not been very great. He had lost every point. But when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged that she would not make herself uneasy. "'I know very well, madam,' said he, "'that when persons sit down to a card-table they must take their chances of these things, and happily I am not in such circumstances as to make five shillings any object. There are undoubtedly many who could not say the same, but, thanks to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters.' Mr. Wickham's attention was caught and, after observing Mr. Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation was very intimately acquainted with the family of de Bourgh. "'Lady Catherine de Bourgh,' she replied, "'has very lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters, consequently that she is aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, indeed I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. Her daughter, Mr. Berg, will have a very large fortune, and it is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates." This information made Elizabeth smile as she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain indeed must be all her attentions, vain and useless her affection for his sister and her praise of himself, if he were already self-destined for another. 
Mr. Collins, said she, speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter, but from some particulars that he has related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both, in a great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride for her nephew, who chooses that every one connected with him should have an understanding of the first class." Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to cards, and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr. Wickham's attentions. There could be no conversation in the noise of Mrs. Phillips's supper-party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said, was said well, and whatever he did, done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but of Mr. Wickham, and of what he had told her, all the way home. But there was not time for her even to mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr. Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets, of the fish she had lost, and the fish she had won, and Mr. Collins, in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, enumerating all the dishes at supper, and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longbourn House. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Elizabeth related to Jane the next day what had passed between Mr. Wickham and herself. Jane listened with astonishment and concern. She knew not how to believe that Mr. Darcy could be so unworthy of Mr. Bingley's regard, and yet it was not in her nature to question the veracity of a young man of such amiable appearance as Wickham. The possibility of his having endured such unkindness was enough to interest all her tender feelings, and nothing remained therefore to be done but to think well of them both to defend the conduct of each, and throw into the account of accident or mistake whatever could not be otherwise explained. "'They have both,' said she, "'been deceived, I dare say, in some way or other, of which we can form no idea. Interested people have perhaps misrepresented each to the other. It is, in short, impossible for us to conjecture the causes or circumstances which may have alienated them, without actual blame on either side.' "'Very true, indeed. And now, my dear Jane, what have you got to say on behalf of the interested people who have probably been concerned in the business? Do clear them, too, or we shall be obliged to think ill of somebody. Laugh as much as you choose, but you will not laugh me out of my opinion. My dearest Lizzy, do but consider in what a disgraceful light it places Mr. Darcy to be treating his father's favourite in such a manner, one whom his father had promised to provide for. It is impossible. No man of common humanity, no man who had any value for his character, could be capable of it. Can his most intimate friends be so excessively deceived in him? Oh, no! I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on, than that Mr. Wickham should invent such a history of himself as he gave me last night. Names, facts, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr. Darcy contradict it. Besides, there was truth in his looks. It is difficult, indeed. It is distressing. One does not know what to think. I beg your pardon, one knows exactly what to think. But Jane could think with certainty on only one point, that Mr. Bingley, if he had been imposed on, would have much to suffer when the affair became public. The two young ladies were summoned from the shrubbery where this conversation passed, by the arrival of the very persons of whom they had been speaking. Mr. Bingley and his sisters came to give their personal invitation for the long-expected ball at Netherfield, which was fixed for the following Tuesday. The two ladies were delighted to see their dear friend again, called it an age since they had met, and repeatedly asked what she had been doing with herself since their separation. To the rest of the family they paid little attention, avoiding Mrs. Bennet as much as possible, saying not much to Elizabeth, and nothing at all to the others. They were soon gone again, rising from their seats with an activity which took their brother by surprise, and hurrying off as if eager to escape from Mrs. Bennet's civilities. The prospect of the Netherfield ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the family. Mrs. Bennet chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter, and was particularly flattered by receiving the invitation from Mr. Bingley himself, instead of a ceremonious card. 
Jane pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of her two friends, and the attentions of their brother, and Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr. Wickham, and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr. Darcy's look and behaviour. The happiness anticipated by Catherine and Lydia depended less on any single event, or any particular person, for though they each, like Elizabeth, meant to dance half the evening with Mr. Wickham, he was by no means the only partner who could satisfy them, and a ball was, at any rate, a ball and even Mary could assure her family that she had no disinclination for it. "'While I can have my mornings to myself,' said she, "'it is enough. I think it is no sacrifice to join occasionally in evening engagements. Society has claims on us all, and I profess myself one of those who consider intervals of recreation and amusement as desirable for everybody.' Elizabeth's spirits were so high on this occasion, that, though she did not often speak unnecessarily to Mr. Collins, she could not help asking him whether he intended to accept Mr. Bingley's invitation, and, if he did, whether he would think it proper to join in the evening's amusement. And she was rather surprised to find that he entertained no scruple whatever on that head, and was very far from dreading a rebuke, either from the Archbishop or Lady Catherine de Bourgh, by venturing to dance. "'I am by no means of the opinion, I assure you,' said he, "'that a ball of this kind, given by a young man of character to respectable people, can have any evil tendency, and I am so far from objecting to dancing myself, that I shall hope to be honoured with the hands of all my fair cousins in the course of the evening, and I take this opportunity of soliciting yours, Miss Elizabeth, for the first two dances especially.' a preference which I trust my cousin Jane will attribute to the right cause, and not to any disrespect for her." Elizabeth felt herself completely taken in. She had fully proposed being engaged by Mr. Wickham for those very dances, and to have Mr. Collins instead. Her liveliness had never been worse timed. There was no help for it, however. Mr. Wickham's happiness and her own were perforce delayed a little longer, and Mr. Collins' proposal accepted with as good a grace as she could. She was not the better pleased with his gallantry from the idea it suggested of something more. It now first struck her that she was selected from among her sisters, as worthy of being mistress of Hunsford Parsonage, and of assisting to form a quadrille-table at Rosings, in the absence of more eligible visitors. The idea soon reached a conviction, as she observed his increasing civilities toward herself, and heard his frequent attempt at a compliment on her wit and vivacity, and though more astonished than gratified herself by this effect of her charms, it was not long before her mother gave her to understand that the probability of their marriage was extremely agreeable to her. Elizabeth, however, did not choose to take the hint, being well aware that a serious dispute must be the consequence of any reply. Mr. Collins might never make the offer. Until he did, it was useless to quarrel about him. If there had not been a Netherfield ball to prepare for and talk of, the younger Miss Bennets would have been in a very pitiable state at this time, for from the day of the invitation to the day of the ball, there was such a succession of rain as prevented their walking to Meryton once. No aunt, no officers, no news could be sought after. The very shoe-roses for Netherfield were got by proxy. Even Elizabeth might have found some trial of her patience, in weather which totally suspended the improvement of her acquaintance with Mr. Wickham and nothing less than a dance on Tuesday could have made such a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday endurable to Kitty and Lydia. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18. Till Elizabeth entered the drawing-room at Netherfield, and looked in vain for Mr. Wickham among the cluster of red coats there assembled, a doubt of his being present had never occurred to her. The certainty of meeting him had not been checked by any of those recollections that might not unreasonably have alarmed her. She had dressed with more than usual care, and prepared in the highest spirits for the conquest of all that remained unsubdued of his heart, trusting that it was not more than might be won in the course of the evening. But in an instant arose the dreadful suspicion of his being purposely omitted from Mr. Darcy's pleasure in the Bingley's invitation to the officers and though this was not exactly the case, the absolute fact of his absence was pronounced by his friend Denny, to whom Lydia eagerly applied, and who told them that Wickham had been obliged to go to town on business the day before, and was not yet returned, adding with a significant smile, "'I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now, if he had not wanted to avoid a certain gentleman here.' This part of his intelligence, though unheard by Lydia, was caught by Elizabeth, 
and as it assured her that Darcy was not less answerable for Wickham's absence than if her first surmise had been just, every feeling of displeasure against the former was so sharpened by immediate disappointment, that she could hardly reply with tolerable civility to the polite inquiries which he directly afterwards approached to make. Attendance, forbearance, patience with Darcy, was injury to Wickham. She was resolved against any sort of conversation with him, and turned away with a degree of ill-humour which she could not wholly surmount even in speaking to Mr. Bingley, whose blind partiality provoked her. But Elizabeth was not formed for ill-humour, and though every prospect of her own was destroyed for the evening, it could not dwell long on her spirits, and having told all her griefs to Charlotte Lucas, whom she had not seen for a week, she was soon able to make a voluntary transition to the oddities of her cousin, and to point him out to her particular notice. The first two dances, however, brought a return of distress. They were dances of mortification. Mr. Collins, awkward and solemn, apologising instead of attending, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, gave her all the shame and misery which a disagreeable partner for a couple of dances can give. The moment of her release from him was ecstasy. She danced next with an officer, and had the refreshment of talking of Wickham, and of hearing that he was universally liked. When those dances were over, she returned to Charlotte Lucas, and was in conversation with her when she found herself suddenly addressed by Mr. Darcy, who took her so much by surprise in his application for her hand, that, without knowing what she did, she accepted him. He walked away again immediately, and she was left to fret over her own want of presence of mind. Charlotte tried to console her. "'I dare say you will find him very agreeable.' "'Heaven forbid! That would be the greatest misfortune of all. To find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate? Do not wish me such an evil." When the dancing recommenced, however, and Darcy approached to claim her hand, Charlotte could not help cautioning her in a whisper not to be a simpleton, and allow her fancy for Wickham to make her appear unpleasant in the eyes of a man ten times his consequence. Elizabeth made no answer, and took her place in the set, amazed at the dignity to which she was arrived in being allowed to stand opposite Mr. Darcy, and reading in her neighbour's looks their equal amazement in beholding it. They stood for some time without speaking a word, and she began to imagine that their silence was to last through the two dances, and at first was resolved not to break it, till suddenly, fancying that it would make the greater punishment to her partner to oblige him to talk, she made some slight observation on the dance. He replied, and was again silent. After a pause of some minutes, she addressed him a second time with, "'It is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy.' I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some sort of remark on the size of the room, or the number of couples." He smiled, and assured her that whatever she wished him to say should be said. "'Very well. That reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. But now we may be silent. Do you talk by rule, then, while you are dancing? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. It would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together. And yet, for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged, as that they might have the trouble of saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you are gratifying mine?" Both, replied Elizabeth archly, for I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room, and be handed down to posterity with all the eclat of a proverb. "'This is no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure,' said he. "'How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I must not decide on my own performance.' He made no answer, and they were again silent, till they had gone down the dance, when he asked her if she and her sisters did not very often walk to Meryton. She answered in the affirmative, and, unable to resist the temptation, added, "'When you met us there the other day, we had just been forming a new acquaintance.' The effect was immediate. A deeper shade of hauteur overspread his features, but he said not a word, and Elizabeth, though blaming herself for her own weakness, could not go on. At length Darcy spoke, and in a constrained manner said, "'Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain.' "'He has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship,' replied Elizabeth with emphasis and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life." Darcy made no answer, and seemed desirous of changing the subject. At that moment Sir William Lucas appeared close to them, meaning to pass through the set to the other side of the room, but on perceiving Mr. Darcy he stopped with a bow of superior courtesy to compliment him on his dancing and his partner. 
"'I have been most highly gratified indeed, my dear sir. Such very superior dancing is not often seen. It is evident that you belong to the first circles. Allow me to say, however, that your fair partner does not disgrace you, and that I must hope to have this pleasure often repeated, especially when a certain desirable event, my dear Eliza, glancing at her sister in Bingley, shall take place. What congratulations will then flow in! I appeal to Mr. Darcy. But let me not interrupt you, sir. You will not thank me for detaining you from the bewitching converse of that young lady, whose bright eyes are also upbraiding me." The latter part of this address was scarcely heard by Darcy, but Sir William's allusion to his friend seemed to strike him forcibly, and his eyes were directed with a very serious expression towards Bingley and Jane, who were dancing together. Recovering himself, however, shortly, he turned to his partner, and said, "'Sir William's interruption has made me forget what we were talking of.' "'I do not think we were speaking at all. Sir William could not have interrupted two people in the room who had less to say for themselves. We have tried two or three subjects already without success, and what we are to talk of next I cannot imagine." "'What think you of books?' said he, smiling. "'Books? Oh, no! I am sure we never read the same, or not with the same feelings.' "'I am sorry you think so. But if that be the case, there can at least be no want of subject. We may compare our different opinions. No, I cannot talk of books in a ballroom. My head is always full of something else." "'The present always occupies you in such scenes, does it?' said he, with a look of doubt. "'Yes, always,' she replied, without knowing what she said, for her thoughts had wandered far from the subject, as soon afterwards appeared by her suddenly exclaiming, "'I remember hearing you once say, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was unappeasable. You are very cautious, I suppose, as to its being created?' I am," said he, with a firm voice, and never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice? I hope not. It is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion to be secure of judging properly at first. May I ask to what these questions tend? Merely to the illustration of your character," said she, endeavouring to shake off her gravity. I am trying to make it out. And what is your success? She shook her head. I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly." "'I can readily believe,' answered he, gravely, "'that reports may vary greatly with respect to me. And I could wish, Miss Bennet, that you were not to sketch my character at the present moment, as there is reason to fear that the performance would reflect no credit on either. But if I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity." "'I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours,' he coldly replied. She said no more and they went down the other dance and parted in silence, and on each side dissatisfied, though not to an equal degree. For in Darcy's breast there was a tolerable powerful feeling towards her, which soon procured her pardon, and directed all his anger against another. They had not long separated when Miss Bingley came towards her, and with an expression of civil disdain accosted her. "'So, Miss Eliza, I hear you are quite delighted with George Wickham. Your sister has been talking to me about him, and asking me a thousand questions, and I find that the young man quite forgot to tell you, among his other communication, that he was the son of old Wickham, the late Mr. Darcy's steward. Let me recommend you, however, as a friend, not to give implicit confidence to all his assertions, for as to Mr. Darcy's using him ill, it is perfectly false, for on the contrary, he has always been remarkably kind to him, though George Wickham has treated Mr. Darcy in a most infamous manner. I do not know the particulars, but I know very well that Mr. Darcy is not in the least to blame, that he cannot bear to hear George Wickham mentioned, and that, though my brother thought he could not well avoid including him in his invitation to the officers, he was excessively glad to find that he had taken himself out of the way. His coming into the country at all is a most insolent thing, indeed, and I wonder how he could presume to do it. I pity you, Miss Eliza, for this discovery of your favourite's guilt, but really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better." His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same," said Elizabeth angrily, for I have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than of being the son of Mr. Darcy's steward, and of that, I can assure you, he informed me himself." "'I beg your pardon,' replied Miss Bingley, turning away with a sneer. "'Excuse my interference. It was kindly meant.' "'Insolent girl,' said Elizabeth to herself. "'You are much mistaken if you expect to influence me by such a paltry attack as this. I see nothing in it but your own wilful ignorance and the malice of Mr. Darcy." She then sought her eldest sister, who had undertaken to make inquiries on the same subject of Bingley. 
Jane met her with a smile of such sweet complacency, a glow of such happy expression, as sufficiently marked how well she was satisfied with the occurrences of the evening. Elizabeth instantly read her feelings, and at that moment solicitude for Wickham, resentment against his enemies, and everything else, gave way before the hope of Jane's being in the fairest way for happiness. "'I want to know,' said she, with a countenance no less smiling than her sister's, "'what you have learnt about Mr. Wickham. But perhaps you have been too pleasantly engaged to think of any third person, in which case you may be sure of my pardon.' "'No,' replied Jane, "'I have not forgotten him, but I have nothing satisfactory to tell you.' Mr. Bingley does not know the whole of his history, and is quite ignorant of the circumstances which have principally offended Mr. Darcy, but he will vouch for the good conduct, the probity and honour of his friend, and is perfectly convinced that Mr. Wickham has deserved much less attention from Mr. Darcy than he has received. And I am sorry to say by his account as well as his sister's, Mr. Wickham is by no means a respectable young man. I am afraid he has been very imprudent, and has deserved to lose Mr. Darcy's regard." Mr. Bingley does not know Mr. Wickham himself? No, he never saw him till the other morning at Meryton. This account, then, is what he has received from Mr. Darcy. I am satisfied. But what does he say of the living? He does not exactly recollect the circumstances, though he has heard them from Mr. Darcy more than once, but he believes that it was left to him conditionally only. I have not a doubt of Mr. Bingley's sincerity, said Elizabeth warmly, but you must excuse my not being convinced by assurances only. Mr. Bingley's defence of his friend was a very able one, I dare say, but since he is unacquainted with several parts of the story, and has learnt the rest from that friend himself, I shall venture to still think of both gentlemen as I did before." She then changed the discourse to one more gratifying to each, and on which there could be no difference of sentiment. Elizabeth listened with delight to the happy, though modest, hopes which Jane entertained of Mr. Bingley's regard, and said all in her power to heighten her confidence in it. On their being joined by Mr. Bingley himself, Elizabeth withdrew to Miss Lucas, to whose inquiry after the pleasantness of her last partner she had scarcely replied, before Mr. Collins came up to them, and told her with great exultation that he had just been so fortunate as to make a most important discovery. "'I have found out,' said he, "'by a singular accident, that there is now in the room a near relation of my patroness. I happened to overhear the gentleman himself mentioning to the young lady who does the honours of the house, the names of his cousin, Mr. Burgh, and of her mother, Lady Catherine. How wonderfully these sort of things occur! Who would have thought of my meeting with perhaps a nephew of Lady Catherine de Burgh in this assembly? I am most thankful that the discovery is made in time for me to pay my respects to him, which I am now going to do, and trust he will excuse my not having done it before. My total ignorance of the connection, my plead my apology. You are not going to introduce yourself to Mr. Darcy?" "'Indeed I am. I shall entreat his pardon for not having done it earlier. I believe him to be Lady Catherine's nephew. It will be in my power to assure him that her ladyship was quite well yesterday, said I. Elizabeth tried hard to dissuade him from such a scheme, assuring him that Mr. Darcy would consider his addressing him without introduction as an impertinent freedom, rather than a compliment to his aunt that it was not in the least necessary there should be any notice on either side, and that if it were, it must belong to Mr. Darcy, the superior in consequence, to begin the acquaintance. Mr. Collins listened to her with a determined air of following his own inclination, and when she ceased speaking, replied thus, "'My dear Miss Elizabeth, I have the highest opinion in the world in your excellent judgment in all manners within the scope of your understanding. But permit me to say that there must be a wide difference between the established forms of ceremony amongst the laity and those which regulate the clergy. For give me leave to observe that I consider the clerical office as equal in point of dignity with the highest rank in the kingdom, provided that a proper humility of behaviour is at the same time maintained. You must therefore allow me to follow the dictates of my conscience on this occasion, which leads me to perform what I look on as a point of duty. Pardon me for neglecting to profit by your advice, which on every other subject shall be my constant guide, though in the case before us I consider myself more fitted by education and habitual study to decide on what is right than a young lady like yourself." And with a low bow, he left her to attack Mr. Darcy whose reception of his advances she eagerly watched, and whose astonishment at being so addressed was very evident. Her cousin prefaced his speech with a solemn bow, and though she could not hear a word of it, she felt as if hearing it all, 
and saw in the motion of his lips the words, Apology, Hunsford and Lady Catherine de Bourgh, it vexed her to see him expose himself to such a man. Mr. Darcy was eyeing him with unrestrained wonder, and when at last Mr. Collins allowed him time to speak, replied with an air of distant civility. Mr. Collins, however, was not discouraged from speaking again, and Mr. Darcy's contempt seemed abundantly increasing with the length of his second speech, and at the end of it he only made him a slight bow, and moved another way. Mr. Collins then returned to Elizabeth. "'I have no reason, I assure you,' said he, "'to be dissatisfied with my reception. Mr. Darcy seemed much pleased with the attention. He answered me with the utmost civility, and even paid me the compliment of saying that he was so well convinced of Lady Catherine's discernment, as to be certain she could never bestow a favour unworthily. It was really a very handsome thought. Upon the whole, I am much pleased with him." As Elizabeth had no longer any interest of her own to pursue, she turned her attention almost entirely on her sister and Mr. Bingley. The train of agreeable reflections which her observations gave birth to, made her perhaps almost as happy as Jane. She saw her in idea, settled in that very house, in all the felicity which a marriage of true affection could bestow, and she felt capable, under such circumstances, of endeavouring even to like Bingley's two sisters. Her mother's thoughts, she plainly saw, were bent the same way, and she determined not to venture near her, lest she might hear too much. When they sat down to supper, therefore, she considered it a most unlucky perverseness which placed them within one of each other, and deeply was she vexed to find that her mother was talking to that one person, Lady Lucas, freely, openly, and of nothing else but her expectation that Jane would soon be married to Mr. Bingley. It was an animating subject, and Mrs. Bennet seemed incapable of fatigue while enumerating the advantages of the match. His being such a charming young man, and so rich, and living but three miles from them, were the first points of self-gratulation. And then it was such a comfort to think how fond the two sisters were of Jane, and to be certain that they must desire the connection as much as she could do. It was, moreover, such a promising thing for her younger daughters, as Jane's marrying so greatly must throw them in the way of other rich men. And lastly, it was so pleasant at her time of life to be able to consign her single daughters to the care of their sister, that she might not be obliged to go into company more than she liked. It was necessary to make this circumstance a matter of pleasure, because on such occasions it is the etiquette. But no one was less likely than Mrs. Bennet to find comfort in staying home at any period of her life. She concluded with many good wishes that Lady Lucas might soon be equally fortunate, though evidently and triumphantly believing there was no chance of it. In vain did Elizabeth endeavour to check the rapidity of her mother's words, or persuade her to describe her felicity in a less audible whisper, for to her inexpressible vexation she could perceive that the chief of it was overheard by Mr. Darcy, who sat opposite to them. Her mother only scolded her for being nonsensical. "'What is Mr. Darcy to me, pray, that I should be afraid of him? I am sure we owe him no such particular civility as to be obliged to say nothing he may not like to hear. For heaven's sake, madam, speak lower. What advantage can it be for you to offend Mr. Darcy? You will never recommend yourself to his friend by so doing.' Nothing that she could say, however, had any influence. Her mother would talk of her views in the same intelligible tone. Elizabeth blushed and blushed again with shame and vexation. She could not help frequently glancing her eye at Mr. Darcy, though every glance convinced her of what she dreaded. For though he was not always looking at her mother, she was convinced that his attention was invariably fixed by her. The expression of his face changed gradually from indignant contempt to a composed and steady gravity. At length, however, Mrs. Bennet had no more to say, and Lady Lucas, who had long been yawning at the repetition of delights which she saw no likelihood of sharing, was left to the comforts of cold ham and chicken. Elizabeth now began to revive. But not long was the interval of tranquillity, for when supper was over, singing was talked of, and she had the mortification of seeing Mary, after very little entreaty, preparing to oblige the company. By many significant looks and silent entreaties did she endeavour to prevent such a proof of complaisance, but in vain. Mary would not understand them. Such an opportunity of exhibiting was delightful to her, and she began her song. Elizabeth's eyes were fixed on her with most painful sensations, and she watched her progress through the several stanzas with an impatience which was very ill rewarded at their close. For Mary, on receiving amongst the thanks of the table the hint of a hope that she might be prevailed on to favour them again, after the pause of half a minute began another. 
Mary's powers were by no means fitted for such a display. Her voice was weak, and her manner affected. Elizabeth was in agonies. She looked at Jane to see how she bore it, but Jane was very composedly talking to Bingley. She looked at his two sisters, and saw them making signs of derision at each other, and at Darcy, who continued, however, imperturbably grave. She looked at her father to entreat his interference, lest Mary should be singing all night. He took the hint, and when Mary had finished her second song, said aloud, "'That will do extremely well, child. You have delighted us long enough. Let the other young ladies have time to exhibit.' Mary, though pretending not to hear, was somewhat disconcerted, and Elizabeth, sorry for her, and sorry for her father's speech, was afraid her anxiety had done no good. Others of the party were now applied to. "'If I,' said Mr. Collins, "'were so fortunate as to be able to sing, I should have great pleasure, I am sure, in obliging the company with an air, for I consider music as a very innocent diversion, and perfectly compatible with the profession of a clergyman. I do not mean, however, to assert that we can be justified in devoting too much of our time to music, for there are certainly other things to be attended to. The rector of a parish has much to do. In the first place, he must make such an agreement for tithes as may be beneficial to himself, and not offensive to his patron. He must write his own sermons, and the time that remains will not be too much for his parish duties, and the care and improvement of his dwelling, which he cannot be excused from making as comfortable as possible. And I do not think it of light importance that he should have attentive and conciliatory manner towards everybody, especially towards those to whom he owes his preferment. I cannot acquit him of that duty, nor could I think well of the man who should omit an occasion of testifying his respect towards anybody connected with the family." And with a bow to Mr. Darcy he concluded his speech, which had been spoken so loud as to be heard by half the room. Many stared, many smiled, but no one looked more amused than Mr. Bennet himself, while his wife seriously commended Mr. Collins for having spoken so sensibly, and observed in a half-whisper to Lady Lucas that he was a remarkably clever, good kind of young man. To Elizabeth it appeared that, had her family made an agreement to expose themselves as much as they could during the evening, it would have been impossible for them to play their parts with more spirit or finer success, and happy did she think it for Bingley and her sister that some of the exhibition had escaped his notice, and that his feelings were not of a sort to be much distressed by the folly which he must have witnessed. That his two sisters and Mr. Darcy, however, should have such an opportunity of ridiculing her relations was bad enough, and she could not determine whether the silent contempt of the gentlemen or the insolent smiles of the ladies were more intolerable. The rest of the evening brought her little amusement. She was teased by Mr. Collins, who continued most perseveringly by her side, and though he could not prevail on her to dance with him again, put it out of her power to dance with others. In vain did she entreat him to stand up with somebody else, and offer to introduce him to any young lady in the room. He assured her that as to dancing he was perfectly indifferent to it, that his chief object was by delicate attentions to recommend himself to her, and that he should therefore make a point of remaining close to her the whole evening. There was no arguing upon such a project. She owed her greatest relief to her friend Miss Lucas, who often joined them, and good-naturedly engaged Mr. Collins' conversation to herself. She was at least free from the offence of Mr. Darcy's further notice. Though often standing within a very short distance of her, quite disengaged, he never came near enough to speak. She felt it to be the probable consequence of her allusions to Mr. Wickham, and rejoiced in it. The Longbourn party was the last of all the company to depart, and, by a manoeuvre of Mrs. Bennet, had to wait for their carriage a quarter of an hour after everybody else was gone, which gave them time to see how heartily they were wished away by some of the family. Mrs. Hurst and her sister scarcely opened their mouths, except to complain of fatigue, and were evidently impatient to have the house to themselves. They repulsed every attempt of Mrs. Bennet at conversation, and by so doing threw a languor over the whole party which was very little relieved by the long speeches of Mr. Collins, who was complimenting Mr. Bingley and his sisters on the elegance of their entertainment, and the hospitality and politeness which had marked their behaviour to their guests. Darcy said nothing at all. Mr. Bennet, in equal silence, was enjoying the scene. Mr. Bingley and Jane were standing together, a little detached from the rest, and talked only to each other. Elizabeth preserved as steady a silence as either Mrs. Hurst or Miss Bingley, and even Lydia was too much fatigued to utter more than the occasional exclamation of, "'Lord, how tired I am!' accompanied by a violent yawn. 
When at length they arose to take leave, Mrs. Bennet was most pressingly civil in her hope of seeing the whole family soon at Longbourn, and addressed herself especially to Mr. Bingley, to assure him how happy he would make them by eating a family dinner with them at any time, without the ceremony of a formal invitation. Bingley was all grateful pleasure, and he readily engaged for taking the earliest opportunity of waiting on her, after his return from London, whither he was obliged to go the next day for a short time. Mrs. Bennet was perfectly satisfied, and quitted the house under the delightful persuasion that, allowing for the necessary preparations of settlements, new carriages, and wedding-clothes, she should undoubtedly see her daughter settled at Netherfield in the course of three or four months. Of having another daughter married to Mr. Collins, she thought with equal certainty, and with considerable, though not equal, pleasure. Elizabeth was the least dear to her of all her children, and though the man and the match were quite good enough for her, the worth of each was eclipsed by Mr. Bingley and Netherfield. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The next day opened a new scene at Longbourn. Mr. Collins made his declaration in form. Having resolved to do it without loss of time, as his leave of absence extended only to the following Saturday, and having no feelings of diffidence to make it distressing to himself even at the moment, he set about it in a very orderly manner, with all the observances, which he supposed a regular part of the business. On finding Mrs. Bennet, Elizabeth, and one of the younger girls together, soon after breakfast, he addressed the mother in these words. May I hope, madam, that for your interest with your fair daughter Elizabeth, when I solicit for the honour of a private audience with her in the course of this morning?" Before Elizabeth had time for anything but a blush of surprise, Mrs. Bennet answered instantly, "'Oh, dear, yes, certainly. I am sure Lizzie will be very happy. I am sure she can have no objection. Come, Kitty, I want you upstairs.' And gathering her work together, she was hastening away, when Elizabeth called out, "'Dear madam, do not go. I beg you will not go. Mr. Collins must excuse me. He can have nothing to say to me that anybody need not hear. I am going away myself.' "'No, no, nonsense, Lizzie. I desire you to stay where you are.' And upon Elizabeth seeming really, with vexed and embarrassed looks about to escape, she added, "'Lizzie, I insist upon your staying and hearing Mr. Collins.' Elizabeth would not oppose such an injunction, and a moment's consideration making her also sensible that it would be wisest to get it over as soon and as quietly as possible, she sat down again, and tried to conceal, by incessant employment, the feelings which were divided between distress and diversion. Mrs. Bennet and Kitty walked off, and as soon as they were gone, Mr. Collins began. "'Believe me, my dear Miss Elizabeth, that your modesty, so far from doing you any disservice, rather adds to your other perfections. You would have been less amiable in my eyes, had there not been this little unwillingness. But allow me to assure you that I have your respected mother's permission for this address. You can hardly doubt the purport of my discourse, however your natural delicacy may lead you to dissemble. My attentions have been too marked to be mistaken. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. But before I am run away with by my feelings on this subject, perhaps it would be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying, and, moreover, for coming into Hertfordshire with the design of selecting a wife, as I certainly did." The idea of Mr. Collins, with all his solemn composure, being run away with by his feelings, made Elizabeth so near laughing that she could not use the short pause he allowed in any attempt to stop him further. And he continued, "'My reasons for marrying are, first, that I think it a right thing for every clergyman in easy circumstances, like myself, to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, that I am convinced that it will add very greatly to my happiness, and thirdly, which perhaps I ought to have mentioned earlier, that it is the particular advice and recommendation of the very noble lady whom I have the honour of calling patroness. Twice has she condescended to give me her opinion, unasked, too, on this subject and it was but the very Saturday night before I left Hunsford, between our pools at Quadrille, while Mrs. Jenkinson was arranging Mr. Berg's footstool, that she said, "'Mr. Collins, you must marry. A clergyman like you must marry. Choose properly. 
choose a gentlewoman for my sake, and for your own, let her be an active, useful sort of person, not brought up high, but able to make a small income go a good way. This is my advice. Find such a woman as soon as you can, bring her to Hunsford, and I will visit her. Allow me, by the way, to observe, my fair cousin, that I do not reckon the notice and kindness of Lady Catherine de Bourgh as among the least of the advantages in my power to offer. You will find her manners beyond anything I can describe, and your wit and vivacity, I think, must be acceptable to her, especially when tempered with the silence and respect which her rank will inevitably excite. Thus much for my general intention in favour of matrimony. It remains to be told why my views were directed towards Longbourn instead of my own neighbourhood, where I can assure you there are many amiable young women. But the fact is that, being as I am to inherit this estate after the death of your honoured father, who, however, may live many years longer, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters, that the loss to them might be as little as possible when the melancholy event takes place, which, however, as I have already said, may not be for several years. This has been my motive, fair cousin, and I flatter myself it will not sink me in your esteem. And now nothing remains for me but to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. To fortune I am perfectly indifferent, and shall make no demand of that nature on your father, since I am well aware that it could not be complied with, and that one thousand pounds in the four per cents, which will not be yours till after your mother's decease, is all that you may ever be entitled to. On that head, therefore, I shall be uniformly silent, and you may assure yourself that no ungenerous reproach shall ever pass my lips when we are married." It was absolutely necessary to interrupt him now. "'You are too hasty, sir,' she cried. "'You forget that I have made no answer. Let me do it without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. I am very sensible of the honour of your proposals but it is impossible for me to do otherwise than to decline them." "'I am not now to learn,' replied Mr. Collins, with a formal wave of the hand, "'that it is usual with young ladies to reject the addresses of the man whom they secretly mean to accept, when he first applies for their favour, and that sometimes the refusal is repeated a second or even a third time. I am therefore by no means discouraged by what you have just said, and shall hope to lead you to the altar ere long. "'Upon my word, sir,' cried Elizabeth, "'your hope is a rather extraordinary one after my declaration. I do assure you that I am not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness on the chance of being asked a second time. I am perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who could make you so. Nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation." "'Were it certain that Lady Catherine would think so,' said Mr. Collins, very gravely, "'but I cannot imagine that her ladyship would at all disapprove of you, and you may be certain when I have the honour of seeing her again I shall speak in the very highest terms of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualification. Indeed, Mr. Collins, all praise of me will be unnecessary. You must give me leave to judge for myself, and pay me the compliment of believing what I say. I wish you very happy and very rich, and by refusing your hand, do all in my power to prevent your being otherwise. In making me the offer, you must have satisfied the delicacy of your feelings with regard to my family, and may take possession of Longbourn estate whenever it falls, without any self-reproach. This matter may be considered, therefore, as finally settled." And rising as she thus spoke, she would have quitted the room, had Mr. Collins not thus addressed her. "'When I do myself the honour of speaking to you next on the subject, I shall hope to receive a more favourable answer than you have now given me, though I am far from accusing you of cruelty at present, because I know it to be the established custom of your sex to reject a man on the first application and perhaps you have even now said as much to encourage my suit as would be consistent with the true delicacy of the female character." "'Really, Mr. Collins,' cried Elizabeth, with some warmth, "'you puzzle me exceedingly. 
If what I have hitherto said can appear to you in the form of encouragement, I know not how to express my refusal in such a way as to convince you of its being one. You must give me leave to flatter myself, my dear cousin, that your refusal of my addresses is merely words of course. My reasons for believing it are briefly these. It does not appear to me that my hand is unworthy of your acceptance, or that the establishment I can offer would be any other than highly desirable. My situation in life, my connections with the family of de Bourg, and my relationship to your own, are circumstances highly in my favour, and you should take it into further consideration that in spite of your manifold attractions, it is by no means certain that another offer of marriage may ever be made you. Your portion is unhappily so small, that it will in all likelihood undo the effects of your loveliness and amiable qualifications. As I must therefore conclude that you are not serious in your rejection of me, I shall choose to attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense, according to the usual practice of elegant females. I do assure you, sir, that I have no pretensions whatever to that kind of elegance which consists in tormenting a respectable man. I would rather be paid the compliment of being believed sincere. I thank you again and again for the honour you have done me in your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. My feelings in every respect forbid it. Can I speak plainer? Do not consider me now as an elegant female intending to plague you, but as a rational creature speaking the truth from her heart. "'You are uniformly charming,' cried he, with an air of awkward gallantry, "'and I am persuaded that when sanctioned by the express authority of both your excellent parents, my proposals will not fail of being acceptable.' To such perseverance in wilful self-deception Elizabeth would make no reply and immediately, and in silence, withdrew, determined, if he persisted in considering her repeated refusals as flattering encouragement, to apply to her father, whose negative might be uttered in such a manner as to be decisive, and whose behaviour at least could not be mistaken for the affectation and coquetry of an elegant female. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Mr. Collins was not left long to the silent contemplation of his successful love, for Mrs. Bennet, having dawdled about in the vestibule to watch for the end of the conference, no sooner saw Elizabeth open the door and with quick step pass her towards the staircase, than she entered the breakfast-room, and congratulated both him and herself in warm terms on the happy prospect of their nearer connection. Mr. Collins received and returned these felicitations with equal pleasure, and then proceeded to relate the particulars of their interview, with the result of which he trusted he had every reason to be satisfied, since the refusal which his cousin had steadfastly given him, would naturally flow from her bashful modesty and the genuine delicacy of her character. This information, however, startled Mrs. Bennet. She would have been glad to be equally satisfied that her daughter had meant to encourage him by protesting against his proposals but she dared not believe it, and could not help saying so. "'But depend upon it, Mr. Collins,' she added, "'that Lizzie shall be brought to reason. I will speak to her about it directly. She is a very headstrong, foolish girl, and does not know her own interest, but I will make her know it.' "'Pardon me for interrupting you, madam,' cried Mr. Collins, "'but if she is really headstrong and foolish, I know not whether she would altogether be a desirable wife to a man in my situation, who naturally looks for happiness in the marriage state. If, therefore, she actually persists in rejecting my suit, perhaps it were better not to force her into accepting me, because if liable to such defects of temper, she could not contribute much to my felicity.' "'Sir, you quite misunderstand me,' said Mrs. Bennet, alarmed. "'Lizzie is only headstrong in such matters as these. In everything else she is as good-natured a girl as ever lived. I will go directly to Mr. Bennet, and we shall very soon settle it with her, I am sure.' She would not give him time to reply, but hurrying instantly to her husband, called out as she entered the library, "'Oh, Mr. Bennet, you are wanted immediately. We are all in an uproar.' You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make haste, he will change his mind and not have her." Mr. Bennet raised his eyes from his book as she entered, and fixed them on her face with a calm unconcern which was not in the least altered by her communication. 
"'I have not the pleasure of understanding you,' said he, when she had finished her speech. "'Of what are you talking?' of Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins begins to say that he will not have Lizzie. And what am I to do on the occasion? It seems a hopeless business. Speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her that you insist upon her marrying him. Let her be called down. She shall hear my opinion. Mrs. Bennet rang the bell, and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as she appeared. I have sent for you on an affair of importance. I understand that Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is it true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well. And this offer of marriage you have refused? I have, sir. Very well. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon your accepting it. Is it not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins, and I will never see you again if you do." Elizabeth could not but smile at such a conclusion of such a beginning, but Mrs. Bennet, who had persuaded herself that her husband regarded the affair as she wished, was excessively disappointed. "'What do you mean, Mr. Bennet, in talking this way? You promised me to insist upon her marrying him.' "'My dear,' replied her husband, "'I have two small favours to request. First, that you will allow me the free use of my understanding on the present occasion, and secondly, of my room. I shall be glad to have the library to myself as soon as may be." Not yet, however, in spite of her disappointment in her husband, did Mrs. Bennet give up the point. She talked to Elizabeth again and again, coaxed and threatened her by turns. She endeavoured to secure Jane in her interest, but Jane, with all possible mildness, declined interfering and Elizabeth, sometimes with real earnestness, and sometimes with playful gaiety, replied to her attacks. Though her manner varied, however, her determination never did. Mr. Collins, meanwhile, was meditating in solitude on what had passed. He thought too well of himself to comprehend on what motives his cousin could refuse him, and though his pride was hurt, he suffered in no other way. His regard for her was quite imaginary, and the possibility of her deserving her mother's reproach prevented his feeling any regret. While the family were in this confusion, Charlotte Lucas came to spend the day with them. She was met in the vestibule by Lydia, who, flying to her, cried in a half-whisper, "'I am glad you are come, for there is such fun here. What do you think has happened this morning? Mr. Collins has made an offer to Lizzie, and she will not have him.' Charlotte hardly had time to answer, before they were joined by Kitty, who came to tell the same news. And no sooner had they entered the breakfast-room, where Mrs. Bennet was alone, than she likewise began on the subject, calling on Miss Lucas for her compassion, and entreating her to persuade her friend Lizzie to comply with the wishes of all her family. "'Pray do, my dear Miss Lucas,' she added in a melancholy tone, "'for nobody is on my side, nobody takes part with me. I am cruelly used, nobody feels for my poor nerves.' Charlotte's reply was spared by the entrance of Jane and Elizabeth. "'Aye, there she comes,' continued Mrs. Bennet, "'looking as unconcerned as may be, and caring no more for us than if we were at York, provided she can have her own way. But I tell you, Miss Lizzy, if you take it into your head to go on refusing every offer of marriage in this way, you will never get a husband at all, and I am sure I do not know who is to maintain you when your father is dead. I shall not be able to keep you, and so I warn you.' I have done with you from this very day. I told you in the library, you know, that I should never speak to you again, and you will find me as good as my word. I have no pleasure in talking to undutiful children. Not that I have much pleasure, indeed, in talking to anybody. People who suffer as much as I do from nervous complaints can have no great inclination for talking. Nobody can tell what I suffer. But it is always so. Those who do not complain are never pitied." Her daughters listened in silence to this effusion, sensible that any attempt to reason with her or soothe her would only increase the irritation. She talked on, therefore, without interruption from any of them, till they were joined by Mr. Collins, who entered the room with an air more stately than usual, and, on perceiving whom, she said to the girls, "'Now I do insist upon it, that you, all of you, hold your tongues, and let me and Mr. Collins have a little conversation together.' Elizabeth passed quietly out of the room. Jane and Kitty followed, but Lydia stood her ground, determined to hear all she could, and Charlotte, detained first by the civility of Mr. Collins, whose inquiries after herself and all her family were very minute, and then, by a little curiosity, satisfied herself with walking to the window and pretending not to hear. 
In a doleful voice Mrs. Bennet began the projected conversation. "'Oh, Mr. Collins!' "'My dear madam,' replied he, "'let us be for ever silent on this point. Far be it from me,' he presently continued, in a voice that marked his displeasure, "'to resent the behaviour of your daughter. Resignation to inevitable evils is the evil duty of us all, the peculiar duty of a young man who has been so fortunate as I have been in early preferment, and I trust I am resigned.' perhaps not the less so from feeling a doubt of my positive happiness, had my fair cousin honoured me with her hand. For I have often observed that resignation is never so perfect as when the blessing denied begins to lose somewhat of its value in our estimation. You will not, I hope, consider me as showing any disrespect to your family, my dear madam, by thus withdrawing my pretensions to your daughter's favour, without having paid yourself and Mr. Bennet the compliment of requesting you to interpose your authority in my behalf. My conduct may, I fear, be objectionable in having accepted my dismission from your daughter's lips instead of your own. But we are all liable to error. I have certainly meant well through the whole affair. My object has been to secure an amiable companion for myself, with due consideration for the advantage of all your family, and if my manner has been at all reprehensible, I here beg leave to apologise. End of chapter 20